Welcome back, wrestling fans. This is Friday Evening's Undercard. I'm John sitting over here. That's Eric over there. How you doing, buddy? Pretty good, man. How are you? Good. I told you I'm hot, man. My air conditioner's not working. It's like 80 degrees down here in Virginia. That's inconvenient. You should tell people it's like working in the sportatorium. <laughs> working in the, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's like working. So this, this will be interesting. So we're here to talk about WCW, and we are recording this on Friday, and I'm hoping to have this out tomorrow. But as we record this it is march 26th which is a significant day because that is the day that wcw went off the air yeah and um not going off the air but the the, the wrestling company that i've been working with in greensboro they are actually having to move out of their building this weekend so the last show for them at the old building is sunday so that's kind of a bummer for them. And I'm sure they didn't plan it to be two days after the death of WCW. Yeah. Or if they did, that was very ironic. So <laughs> that was ironic. Yeah. But no they're not they dead. Did. They're just moving. Yeah. It's like OVW going from that condemned building in Indiana down to the current building that they're at now. Yeah. Uh, no, but I mean, it, it's today's a day that I don't know in history that people think was actually going to happen. No, I don't think anybody thought WCW was just going to be completely gone. Yeah. You know? and, and I think also, I mean, heck, there was a period we could have been talking a couple of years before this event. We could have may well been saying more likely would be WWF that would be in this spot. Yeah. WCW. So, you know, I mean, talk about a total flip in just a matter of, of really about a year and a half. Yeah. And it's just, it's, I mean, not just wrestling, but I think even, you know, in business, very rarely do you see such an upheaval like we saw in 2001. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's almost like another one that I think came out in 2001, which was Enron. Yeah. Where it just went completely downhill, like overnight. Well, it's kind of the old saying these, some of these institutions are too big to fail. And I mean, WCW on paper looked too big to fail. And well, you know, the thing is, is, is they ended up having so many contracts to pay mm -hmm. and they were losing so much money that even time Warner eventually had to say, Hey, okay, wait a minute. We can't, mm -hmm. we can't do this. Well, and also just look at the roster, what you would be putting out in March of 2001 for WCW and look at the roster that you would be putting out for WWF at that time. Yeah. It's night and day. I mean, in terms Absolutely. of star power, in terms of in-ring performance, which draw this out three years before, four years before, you might say, man, WCW is the one with the stacked card. Mm -hmm. They've got everybody. But I think what we saw is, you know, Vince knew he probably couldn't outspend Turner. Right. But he could sure outwork him. And that caused him to create Whoa. new new characters. And that's just the thing is, is they started with new people yeah. over with WWF. And I mean, right up to the end, who did you have? You had the same Scott Steiner that had been around for mm -hmm. quite some time. Yeah. Um, some of the really old hands were gone, obviously Hall and Nash and Hogan, mm -hmm. but I mean, there's not a lot going on. On I mean, either of these two shows that we watched. And I think, you know, WCW obviously caught lightning in a bottle with the NWO storyline. A lot yeah, of that was driven by Hogan doing something different. People weren't going to tune in for red and yellow, eat your vitamins, Hogan. Right. They're definitely turning in to heal Hogan. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, wait and, a minute. He's, he, <laughs> he did this. We didn't expect this. And then, you know, kind of when out of nowhere, they have this guy Goldberg, which I don't think anybody expected was going to be as big as he was for that. No, he was huge. You know, I mean, he was, I mean, I think people forget this period. Goldberg was right up there with Austin. Absolutely. In terms of popularity and the pops he was getting and I mean, everything. And the problem is that next step from the NWO, that next step for Goldberg, they were never able to find. Plus, no, you, you had no idea what the next step was, you know, they, they had that huge moment in, was it July or was it June of 98, where 
Goldberg finally wins the championship off of Hogan and they have yeah. the 50,000 people in the Georgia Dome and this just massive thing. And then, well, what do you do? How do you get the belt off of Goldberg? And they come up with that stupid cooked up angle where um, Kevin Nash hits him with the stun gun, which of course takes you straight to January of 99, yep. which was, I mean, that was the end mm -hmm. right there. Um, well, well, if Goldberg, the streak was, I mean, and we, we, we talk about how shocked people were with the Undertaker streak ending. Yeah, I mean, this streak for Goldberg, you know, I mean, it was something that people were following. People had never seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. Totally fresh character. And I can see ending the streak because eventually the guy's got to lose. Yeah, you got to lose. But the follow-up, you I mean, it writes itself. This super badass face has been screwed out of this. And now he's angry. And now he's coming back for retribution. It writes itself. Yeah. And yeah. they just totally... You yeah, know, they just completely they bungled it. On that one, you know. Yeah, and you know, you ended up with the the Hogan angle where he poked Nash and won the belt yeah. back, and what five hundred thousand people turned the channel, and yeah, I don't know if a lot of them ever came back. And I mean, honestly, you could have even worked that if they pulled that crap off, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes Goldberg. He spears Nash. He spears Hogan. And basically says, you think it was bad before, you're next, and we're off to the races. You could have made the yeah. finger poke work. It's just the problem is you had, I mean, way too many people with creative control in WCW. And you'll hear people going back and forth saying, well, they didn't have it. They did have it. I can't think of any other way the booking was the way it was without some people having, you know, contractual power to say, I'm not doing this, brother. You know? Yeah. Well, and somebody was somebody brought something up online. So I didn't realize this until it came out on Cornette's show, or maybe it was on the dark side of the ring. But I mean, I remember hearing it from Cornette's show that Bret Hart had creative control mm -hmm. for his last several months at WWF. And that's why you ended up with the situation at Montreal. Mm -hmm. And somebody was like, well, no, you can still fire the guy for insubordination for not following his like, no. That's not how it works. That's why it's a contract. Yeah. That would be like the Yankees trying to trade Giancarlo Stanton back to the Marlins and he telling them to pack sand and they fire him because he can yeah. tell them that he has a no trade clause written into his contract that if you want to trade him, he has to approve it. There's a reason those things are written in contracts and they are legally enforceable. And, and I think, too, you know, what we look at, for all these guys that have the guaranteed money, if I'm getting paid what I'm getting paid, whether I show up, whether I actually put on a good match, whether I cut a good yep. promo, what incentive do I have? Whereas I think if you look at the other side at that time, you had a lot of guys in WWE that were trying to vie to be that top guy. Yeah, and obviously, yeah. it's very Austin-centric, but you got The Rock, you got Triple H at this time. Undertaker that there was an still, invested still. stake that hey if you go out and you cut a fire promo you might be the next big thing yeah and i think everybody was trying to maximize that i think it's really a team effort against a collection of individuals in wcw yeah and and i think that's just you can't beat that and well as you, we see the follow-up vince has never recovered from this day either you know it's oh. a win but at what cost to the product really you know yeah no i you know you're right he's never recovered from or, or they've never come close to reaching these kind of heights no no i mean they're probably more mainstream now than they ever have been i mean they're yeah. a publicly traded company everybody knows them but yeah i mean quality of storylines quality of matches and heck even i think just pure you know water cooler talk i don't think people are talking around the water cooler about wrestling anymore no they were 97, 98, 99. Absolutely. And yeah, well, I mean, that was, you know, we were, I mean, we, we lived through all this yeah. in high school through all this. I mean, that was, that was the thing you came in on Tuesday morning mm -hmm. and you were talking about wrestling. Yeah. And also not only that, you probably had two televisions going as well. Potentially. You, you, know, you go down, you go down yeah. to the Walmart, get yourself a cheap splitter Mm -hmm. and you make this happen so you can see what's going on because both shows you didn't want to miss no 
And no. this is also pre DVR days where I can just yeah. record it and watch it later. I mean, you had to watch it live. Yeah. I mean, unless you had a, you know, a tape player. Yeah. And could record one of them. But either way, it had to be playing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you yep. couldn't, you, you could not watch WCW on your TV and record Raw on that same TV. Mm -hmm. You had to have two TVs and they both had to be playing if you were going to do that. And I think, too, you know, what I think is interesting, you see this transition after WCW is done. Yeah, you, know, you get what they like to call the ruthless aggression era, which had some quality moments, actually. It's not. Yeah bad follow-up then when guys like the rock leave when guys like stone cold leaves um who's stepping into that void and i mean let's just face it wwf lucked out by getting two of the brightest shining meteors of superstars ever ever at the same time mm -hmm. and both when they were in a competition and, yeah i mean even even when you had times when it was like warrior and hogan or hogan and savage you always knew who was number one in the company yeah there was no question about that and um and i think the problem is you know does wwf win because they are that good or were they going up an against an opponent that late in the end was just that bad and yeah. and i think some of those lessons you take sometimes a loss is better than a victory in terms of learning lessons and i mean some of the same stuff we see you know without that competition i don't think vince has been tested in 20 years no, I mean, it's TNA, really himself who he's running against. Yeah, and, TNA certainly never tested yeah. him. And, you know, let's be fair. There's a lot of people making good paychecks at AEW mm -hmm. and good for them. But they are not competitors. No. With WWE, not in ratings, not in revenue drawn strictly from wrestling and mm -hmm. definitely definitely not in total revenue well and look at even you know recently aew had their two you know two big surprises coming down the pike who do we get we get two attitude era guys yeah we get the big show and we get christian i yeah. mean nothing against either of them but i mean when you're selling it like you're about to have brock lesnar walk out on tnt mm -hmm. anything less than that We've we have a Hall of Fame level talent coming yeah. to AEW, and, and he is. There's nothing wrong with Christian, but well, he's he's a borderline Hall of Famer. Let's be fair to him. Yeah, I mean, well, he's got a I mean, he has a world title run. He's multi time tag team champ. You know, I mean, he's had a decent career. Um, he's, you know, um, I think. I hate to take away from a, a, a ball player and know this is not because I'm a Yankees fan. I do actually think he's going to go in, but he's, he's very much a Dustin Pedroia mm -hmm. who let's face it. If Dustin Pedroia played for the Houston Astros mm -hmm. with those numbers that he's got, he, he no, you're saying, yeah. okay, he's not a hall of famer. And I think maybe Christian is, but a lot of that is because who you associated him with it's yeah. because he was associated with edge and and edge is absolute oh yes he's an absolute hall of fame guy in any stretch same thing with the hardys mm -hmm. those guys are absolute hall of famers mm -hmm. and the dudleys aren't exactly bums no no so no, I mean, well one they had talent they were also innovative you know, I think with, with Christian, maybe the best analogy we could say to being tagging with, I mean, a really transcendent star is very similar to like a Marty Jannetty with Shawn Michaels. I would obviously say Christian's had a much better career and fortunately yes, he has. Life than Marty Jannetty. Yes, <laughs> like, he has. So, I mean, I think if we look Christian at- Christian has you know, never been on various social platforms saying that he killed a guy and dumped him <laughs> in a ditch. And- Marty Janetti did tell a story that I'm, I can't swear that I got that exactly right, but it was something involving killing a person and dumping the body. You know, if Marty Janetti's not careful, he's going to have his own season of dark side of the ring. Yeah, he is. Like, it's going to be like, yeah, they have the CSI spinoffs. This is going to be like yeah. the dark side of the ring, Marty Janetti spinoff, you know, the dark, dark side of Marty Janetti. Yeah. 
Yeah. But I mean, I think you look at it. I mean, that's the thing that even then for a big star, who are they drawing? When Vince has trouble in the ratings, who does he bring back? Attitude he goes area, the well, he brings back the rock. He brings back Austin. I mean, what does it say for the current? He's bringing level? back Hulk Hogan this year. WrestleMania. Yeah, I mean, what does it say for the current level of superstars that to get that bump, you got to get guys that really have not been relevant in the ring for 20 years. Well, and that's their own fault. Yeah. That's their own fault because for at least 10 years, they have treated everybody like just interchangeable spokes in the wheel. Mm -hmm. They don't make anybody into there. There's no superstar in WWE. There's definitely not a superstar in AEW. There's not anything close to a superstar in impact. And it's not taking away anything from anybody yeah. that works there. Mm -hmm. They're tremendous, talented people, but you know, somebody was asking me something about wrestling. And I said, they're like, this guy's over. And I said, okay, what's your definition of over today? This is when I was, this is when I was living in New York city. Mm -hmm. And I said, if I go to Times Square right now and stop a thousand people, mm -hmm. how many people are going to know this guy? Yeah. In 1986, five, if you went to Times Square and asked how many people knew Hulk Hogan, mm -hmm. what's the answer going to be? It's close to mm -hmm. a thousand. Yeah. And I would say, even if you went down to the Carolinas and showed a picture of Ric Flair, do you know who he is? Oh, it, you, and, and I wouldn't even say do it. Don't even do it in Charlotte. Go to Atlanta. Oh, in 85. Yeah. 85, 86. Yeah. I mean, it's everybody. I mean, heck, I would even say if you put a picture of Arn Anderson out there, you'd probably get a mm -hmm. bunch of people who knew who these guys were. Yeah. You know, Jerry I mean, Lawler were, in Memphis. He oh, was as God. big as Elvis. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's the only guy in L in Memphis that it's not a joke if you want to call Jerry Lawler the king. Yeah, <laughs> that exactly. period, he was just as hot as Elvis. Yeah, and y you know, I mean, so that's where and you know, and WCW did some good things. I mean, the power plant was ahead of its time. I mean, if we're yes. talking about the precursor to NXT and the training center. Yeah, the performance center. This is, I mean, WCW was doing that, and they produced. I mean, hey, they produced basically a Diamond Dallas Page which wasn't yep. a bad hand. They produced Goldberg, which for about a year period was for, as hot as anybody. For, for what he could do. Yeah. But, you know, again, when you look like that, mm -hmm. you don't need to be doing moves. And here was the issue, too. If you look at that time, the undercard for WCW was absolutely loaded at times. The cruiserweights and mid-card oh guys. Malenko, that was that time. Eddie Guerrero, Benoit. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, Guerrero and Malenko starting off Nitro and putting on a clinic, you yeah. know, and then followed up by, like, Ultimo Dragon against Chris Jericho. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. these were killer matches. And I think the problem is, is that when it came time to elevate a guy like Benoit or Jericho or Guerrero. They had no idea how to do it. They couldn't find that way to transition it. And they really – on paper, they had guys that they could have gone over and could have made them stars. Yeah. And just didn't, didn't but, happen. But nobody ever did it. And speaking of, I got my book here. Speaking of power plant guys, we got a um, we got a power plant guy in the first match of the pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. Quee we. Now, that's a WCW name if I've ever seen one. You know, I just Googled him real quick. His last name is Funk. Yeah, no, I saw that. It's, like, it's Alan Funk, right? What? Okay, your last name is Funk? And you're a wrestler. <laughs> and we name you Kiwi? Or Chiwi or whatever the heck it is? Like, really? Yeah. Like, it. it sorry, it writes itself, you know? <laughs> Yeah, why would you change this guy's name, even if he's not related to the to the actual Funks? And yeah, I don't think that. he is. Well, or I think it would be a hilarious storyline if he thinks he's related and you got all these Funks coming out beating the crap out of him, telling him he's not. 
yeah. good television. That's true. You know, I mean, and then maybe finally he has a match against Terry and earns the right to be a funk, you know? I mean, th- but, there's any number of things you could do. But once again, this is like simple booking. Yeah, why? <laughs> If somebody's, like, what? if somebody's real name is Funk, why are you going to change yeah. his name? Yeah. Just why? Yeah. Because it, it's not like the, uh, okay, if if I went to WCW back there in that time and they said, hey, we're going to make your ring name Alan Funk. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, I can see the Funks getting irritated about that. Hey, wait a minute. What are you, what are you doofuses doing? Yeah, but surely they can't. They, you can't get irritated at a guy for wrestling under his real name. No, and I mean, I think too. You throw enough money at the Funks, they're not going to care, and you allow no. Terry to get in the ring. At that point, that's all he wanted. It was like giving a crackhead a hit. Yeah, you know? I mean, he'll yeah. get in the ring for anything, and so I mean, it could write itself. And I mean, it just. I think those were things that you never had. Cons- you look at WCW outside of the top main event name me a really compelling storyline that people still talk about in wcw today Mm, none yeah even wwe in the attitude era even stuff that was middle of the show people still talk about yeah you know so i mean i think that was the so let me let me see some of my funnier some of my funnier notes uh tony shivani Kicking off the show, he says this is the first WCW Greed pay-per-view. And the last. Yes, Tony, it is also the last. <laughs> uh, Wait, don't worry. AEW is going to run Greed in their next pay-per-view. Yeah, they are. They probably bought the rights to it. Kwee is coming to the ring. I have noted his hairline has receded farther than Hulk Hogan's. Brother. Brother. Um... Jason Jett comes down. Kiwi cuts him off out of the ring. 30 seconds in, a super kick with a, sl- with a thigh slap. <laughs> First match goes to the floor. And then I have in quotation marks, Kiwi. Good grief. His hair looks like a troll. I think about it, right? Yeah. He looked like a troll, like a little troll you would go get at Walmart, except for in his case, the pants were the pink part, not the hair. Uh, but see what it was again. Even with that character, they're trying to make an edgy character, but they don't have the same latitude that Vince did. And I think it just was going to fall flat. You know, the it just yeah. I don't know how you yeah. And that was one thing WCW never figured out how to work within the parameters they were given, and they easily could have. I mean you don't have to have the sex and violence to be popular necessarily. No, if you have good storylines, you have compelling matches for that WCW base audience. That's what they want. WCW's audience was ultimately a wrestling audience. Yes. And that's what we have to remember that. Yeah. You know, and they, they should have stuck with that, frankly. Um, here's one for you. Go back and watch it. Seven minutes and 30 seconds. They have a camera issue. You see black corners in the camera. The picture doesn't fill the frame. How very WCW. Mm-hmm. So it was like, like they zoomed the camera to like the widest angle possible, but the actual like circle that the lens took, it, it blacked the corners out. So like you didn't actually have a full picture. Hmm. And, and I mean, and that's the thing too, that WCW, I mean, they got popular despite a corporate structure that did not want them. I mean, let's face it. They were protected. No, now, by Ted when, yeah. So when did the AOL Time Warner merger? That was happen? like, well, didn't that start brewing around like 99, 2000 ish? Yeah, let me see. AOL. I mean, it was brewing for a while, and then it happened. Um, yeah. Um, January of 2000, <laughs> AOL stated it's, its intentions to purchase Time Warner for one point for $164 billion. 
the deal officially filed on February 11th, 2000. Federal Trade Commission cleared the deal on December 14th of 2000. So um basically it 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 sounds like here that pretty much as soon as AOL and Time Warner merged like this was it. Mm-hmm. I mean it was downhill fast for them. Well, and even when Turner was still in control, I mean there were a lot of Turner executives that did not like WCW. Right. And I mean they loved but the it was his thing. Yeah, but you always had Ted that was going to protect it and and I mean, for what they did, I mean, nobody has ever been as close to knocking off Vince than no. maybe the early to mid 80s. If there was something that some people could have done to maybe have stopped that initial push into the territories. Yeah. Which, you know, but I mean, that was, or had WrestleMania bombed. You know, there's the you one. Know, avenue, you know. I always wonder. So I, you know, that, that's the thing with WrestleMania. They always talk about, oh, this, that, and the other about it. W- would it really have been that big of a deal if, if it hadn't have done as good as it did? Because let's just face it, okay, this is Madison Square Garden. Mm-hmm. All right. And Hulk Hogan was hot. Yep. So they were going to sell out the garden one way or another. Mm-hmm. So, the deal was is how much money could they get elsewhere mm-hmm. because that's what they did to bring in T and Muhammad Ali and Liberace and everybody else. But I feel like even if they, they would not have had to close the doors if WrestleMania would not have done what it did. You know, I don't think it would have shut Vince down necessarily but being able to use WrestleMania as leverage later against Crockett and yeah. other territories, he would not have had that. I mean, that was a, and also the money he made, he was actually, Vince was actually paying television stations to play his product. Like if you're Crockett or you're Watts or you're anybody else trying to compete with that, how do you compete? Well, with I mean, that? that's, th- that was standard. I mean, for almost everybody back then, as I understand it. Well, what I'm saying is basically paying to say, I want this slot. I'll give you basically this amount, bump them off. I mean, they were knocking out key markets all over the place, not just Crockett, but I mean, we're talking about, yeah, you know, AWA. But, I mean, and you like know, other than Memphis, because, you know, they could pitch it to them because it was su- such crazy ratings. But, you know, my understanding was that with Mid-South, I mean, they were paying for that product that they were putting on television or they were paying whatever it was a grand a, and you know on all this is making me wonder, or whatever you know at a certain level could we say that march 26 2001 was officially the death of the territories i mean because really the last thing that survived of that era really was wcw and it yeah. always had that if it wasn't crockett owned it still had that crockett connection and lineage and history yeah and when that went away, well, I mean, who else is there? I mean, yeah. you still had ECW for a brief period, I guess, then, but they were, I mean, if they weren't on their way no, out, ECW they were was already gone. That's what I thought. Yeah. They went so, out, I think, in January. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, you have, there's no real competition. Yeah. And no, there's nothing. And also a company that had the lineage that could go toe to toe with WWF. Yeah. I mean, you, you roll out Flair and Rhodes and those guys in certain areas. Oh, they were we saw to... Flair and Dusty on this pay-per-view. Yeah, you do. I mean, <laughs> and what does that say that, you know, in 2001, you're trotting out Rhodes and Flair, nothing against them. Yeah. But guys, this isn't 1987. Yeah, I know. Not 85, you know, I mean, that's. Let's let me see some of my other funnier comments here. Nick Patrick's count is slower than Earl Hebner after Earl got knocked out. Uh, 
a low blow in plain view of the ref. Now, I want to ask, do, do you remember, was there a rule? And I could see this being the case because Flair was in charge and he was known for the <laughs> low blow. Was there a rule in WCW that said low blows were legal during this time period? I'm not sure off the top of my head. I I forgot. I, I'll be honest. I was not watching a lot of WCW programming. In this no, era. I wasn't either. I mean, what does that say that we, we grew up in North Carolina we grew up in Crockett country. Yeah. And we had already shifted. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, yeah, I mean, even then, I mean, that's the biggest thing. If you're going to have rules, you got to enforce them. Yeah. It's got to be across the board. And, you know, I, I haven't noted in here, but I think I counted five times like absolute plain view, like, uppercut through the legs low blows during matches on one pay-per-view mm -hmm. uh let's see what do i have some kind of a power bomb reversal botch spot from the top rope look like it killed both of them <laughs> um a bridge suplex for a two count I've seen 10 counts in boxing shorter than a Nick Patrick two count. Anyway. I don't know if I have any funny notes from the second match, which was interesting. Uh, we have an unmasked Ray Mysterio. Yes. And Billy Kidman against some guy who they've only called prime time. Well, and I mean, Kid it, Romeo, right? Kidman and Mysterio, that's not a shabby tag team. No, it is not. You know, I mean, that's not bad. I mean, once again, those are two talented guys that you could have. I mean, I don't think Mysterio or Kidman would have ever been your top draw, but man, no. they could fill out a good card. Yeah. Um, Kid Romeo, you know, comes I mean, I think once the... again, not... go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not like they're without talent here. No, they've got Eric. plenty of talent. Yeah. Uh, it's also the inaugural WCW Cruiserweight the, Tag Team. Inaugural team. title match. And oh boy, did this tag team title have a long life. I mean, my question is, are they still the, the Cruiserweight Tag Team Champions? No, because there was a title switch. Did someone I actually beat on... them? On the next Nitro, because I guess Primetime wow. and Kid Romeo weren't under contract to go to WWF, and Kidman and Ray were. <laughs> um, Kid Romeo, his music has cowbells in it. I oh, he was ahead of his time. Yes, he was. I thought for a minute we were in a Christopher Walken Saturday Night Live sketch. I mean, that's talk, I mean, talk about being ahead of your time right there. Yeah. Um, Scott Armstrong, going by his uh, birth name, Scott James, uh, the referee for this match. Uh, he looked definitely different with the brown hair. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Oh, um, Scott Armstrong says he will uh, throw Kid Romeo out of the match after he chokes Kidman in the corner when he was not the legal man. I've never, I've never seen or heard of that being a thing in a tag team match that you'll throw the partner out. Um, oh boy. Got a phone call from a spammer. I should have took it. You should have taken right. it on the air. I should have. You should have fun with that. Um, Boy, what do I have here? Will this ever end? I wrote. Who's the legal man? Kid Romeo wins, and I will guarantee you there were no tags for the last five minutes of that match. Mm -hmm. They were just in and out. And he goes out to the cowbell music, and then uh, they go to Buff Bagwell filming his VCR documentary in flair's office and there is a blue oyster cult poster prominently on the wall surely that is not a 
um, coincidence. If it is, talk about a good one. You can't you can't put odds on something like that happening naturally. I, I have no idea what was up with that um, flare segment. Well, and I mean, even if you read like Flair's autobiography and see interviews that he's done, I mean, he talked about he was so mentally checked out at this point. Yeah. That I mean, and this is kind of the sad thing that we look at Flair. I mean, it's kind of funny. He leaves WWF in 1993 because Vince was moving more in a youthful direction. Yeah. And we think that, you know, Flair still had some good life in him. I mean, he had he did. some quality work in, in WWF later that when I mean, you think about this is a wasted period of flair's career oh yeah yeah I mean, from 93 to i mean really 2002 yeah you know he was just nothing he did have that good angle with the nwo yeah but um other than that i don't know and you know that's even one too eventually somebody had to destroy the nwo you almost had to win the war. Yeah. Why was it not some form of the four horsemen that did it? Yeah. You know what I mean? And you could even think about what they did with flair later with evolution. Yeah. You need instant credit. I mean, triple H didn't need it, but Orton and Batista no. certainly can thank their careers where they're at today because of that rub they got from flair. Absolutely. And I mean, and you think like, I mean, both of and them. And you did that, you know, in WCW, you have some version of the horseman of flair there. Maybe instead of, maybe you don't have JJ Dillon because he's going to be your on screen authority figure. Yeah. But maybe have Arn Anderson as your, as like your talk. JJ role. Yeah. Arn can yeah. go with anybody on the mic, you know? Oh, yeah, he can. And now they've and got I mean, him in AEW and he never says anything. Go figure. One of the best promo guys out there. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think that would have been awesome that you have them destroy them in a war games and then yep. you splinter them off, but you create, you roll out those new stars. Like you have some young guy in the horseman yeah. that really stands out. It just, I mean, the thing is, we're not, we're not reinventing the wheel with the booking here. No, you know, it, it's classic timeless things that have worked and it would also be compelling yep. television also for that Southern audience. You're yeah. telling me they would not have loved to see ultimately the horsemen take down guys that they still quote unquote were New York guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It could have worked. And, yeah. And they could have made tons of money on it. Yeah. You know, yeah, they could. maybe have a position for, for Hogan to do a face turn. If you want, if you want to have that pop again, you could do that. You know, um, there's any number of ways you could have done it. And it just sounds, I mean, the more you read about WCW in this era, just how absolutely chaotic. It's amazing they even got television filmed, frankly. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's amazing they were even putting out product. Um, mm -hmm. um, next, we get uh, definitely one of the highlights of the show with the um, Sean Stasiak's valet. Yeah, nobody really cares about Sean Stasiak. No, no, not at all. Most people don't even remember him. No. Anybody who watched wrestling from probably 1998 to like 2005 definitely remembers Stacy Keebler. But here, you know, going up against Bam Bam Bigelow. Mm -hmm. Bam Bam is not the Bam Bam of say 10 years ago. No, he is not. But, but he's still serviceable. Stasiak wasn't bad. And as once again, we saw, I mean, Keebler became a breakout star mm -hmm. under Vince. Yeah. And I mean, this, this was not, um, I have three notes for this match. Uh, it's, it's Stasiak won, which I mean, okay. Yeah. Uh, he has a Hulk Hogan level fake tan. Uh, his nickname is the Mecca of manhood, which just i i don't understand it and another low blow in plain view of the ref i think uh this was i think this is the third match on the card and i believe they have all had low blows the opener had two mm -hmm. i remember hmm. and then we get our first real look at the cruiserweight belts uh they look like they were purchased at the dollar tree 
and uh, they sound like it as well. Well, and also let's think about the cru the cruiserweight division in 2001 compared to what it was just a few years before. Mm -hmm. Their cruiserweight's a name only. You know, I yeah. mean, you just don't have that. I mean, a lot of that quality talent had already migrated to WWF. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because they saw that there was nowhere to go. Yeah. With Hogan and Nash and Savage and, and you Bret look Hart at the and Goldberg and everybody just monopolized them. Mm -hmm. That WWF had from that period from about 2001 to about 2004. It's amazing. Go back and look at some of those pay-per-views, how much talent is on those cards. Yep. Across the board. You know, it's just unreal. And, and once again, WCW had a lot of these guys. Let's think about, too, who's one of the great antagonists of WCW later. It's Steve Austin. Yeah. They had Steve Austin. They had Mick Foley. They had The Undertaker. They had Ron Simmons. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at all these guys they have. you got guys like Flair. you got Sting. I can make a pretty good organization out of those guys as my foundation. Yeah. I could probably make some money with those guys. They yeah, just didn't yeah. know how to use them. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, and I think that was the problem too, is that in that corporate structure, wrestling people were not really used. They would take an entertainment person and put them as the head of WCW. You mean like WWE now? Yeah. You know, you don't have wrestling people that are doing what wrestling people know. Yeah. Because they had been burned. I mean, they had been burned by Oli. They had been burned by Bill Watts. You know, they they had had some issues there. I get that. But yeah. at the end of the day, you know, it would be like me running an auto garage. I don't know how to fix cars. So what I would <laughs> do is rely on the people that do know how to fix cars. Yeah. And I put them in a position to be successful. Right. That's what WCW never did. No. You know? I mean, they had, I mean, Dusty was a good mind. Dusty's as good of a wrestling mind as you're going to have. Yeah. You know, they had some talent there um, as far as even people backstage. Yeah, and, Dusty could have been a good agent or a producer. Oh, I yeah. I don't know if you would have wanted the book at this point in time. But, I mean, you have so much. I think it's not the fact they ran out of talent. It's just wasted talent, frankly. Oh, yeah. Dude, they wasted people so bad. Then again, I would say, the actually, look at this card, though. I mean, this card's better than an AEW card today. Yeah, it is. At least there's people on this card that people might know. Yeah, and actually won't get blown up in the ring when they go. I mean, outside of Bam Bam. But, yeah, you know. I mean, there's some, I mean, and actually looking at some of these guys. Well, actually, we do have, I mean, let's look at some of these people who we've seen on AEW here. Uh, we got Dustin Rhodes. Yeah. Dustin Rhodes, is, talk about your bridge right there, you know. Mm -hmm. But, and the crazy thing is, is Dustin, I mean, I went and looked up his age and I was, I guess I shouldn't say I was surprised. He's 51, yeah. which means he was 31 here, Yeah, which is crazy to think about because we had already seen him for well over 10 years at mm -hmm. this point. Yeah. I mean, he had already had his first run as Gold Dust. Yeah. Well, I mean, point. he had that brief run of Dusty and WWF. Yep. They had that run. Then he goes to WCW as the natural mm -hmm. and had a decent run there. Then he goes, becomes Gold Dust and kind of back and forth. But I mean, this is a guy that, like, literally, from probably the time he's legally able to do it, hopped in a ring. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and I think what's amazing though, is it tells a lot about his work style. Mm -hmm. But he's 51. And he sure doesn't look 51. And in no. the ring, he doesn't look 51. No. I mean, I think he could be he a guy is. like, you know, a couple, you know, a while back, Bullet Bob Armstrong passed away. Mm -hmm. you know, he was the guy that was getting in the ring late in his life. Oh, I yeah. Think I mean, like a year ago. You know, um, he, he has a safe style. And he's in decent shape, you know. Um, and there was some talent in this tag match too. Lance Storm, Mike Awesome, yeah. Hugh Morris, oh, yeah. and Conan. I mean, Conan is mm -hmm. Hall of Famer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolute Hall of Famer. Um. Oh, and then 
I don't, it, it's not going to go down with hard times, but man, this, this promo from Dusty back there in the locker room was funny. <laughs> when he got, he got 240 burritos brought in in a tray. The guy was acting like it hurt his back to carry this tray of burritos in. <laughs> oh man. And then the, the line, the, the, this has to be the best line in the last year of WCW. Dustin's like, Dad, we got a match to prepare for. I know about the match. Ric Flair's face in the crack of my ass. That's the match. <laughs> and I, I, I had to stop the show. I was laughing so hard. But once again, this is basically retired Dusty Rhodes. Yeah. Still better on the mic than, than anybody. anybody in the business today. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and, but you know, the thing is, is that's one of those lines. Like, if anybody else said it, you're like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But dusty because it's works. Flair or because it's mm -hmm. Dusty and because it's Flair and they've had this thing for 20 years, yeah. over 20 years, that they've been wrestling each other, <laughs> you know, it works. Yeah. Um, we did. Well, and see, that was, they were able to, they had the ability to tap into the nostalgia of the crowd at yeah. certain times. Because let's face it, nostalgia has always worked in pro wrestling. It's nothing new. I mean, how many times if Vince wanted to bump the house at Madison Square Garden, did he have Bruno show up? Bruno or Pedro. Yeah. You know, I mean, if we need to bump the show, get those guys in. Yep. You know, I mean, that wasn't uncommon. So, I mean, it always has worked. And that what goes back to WCW had as good of a lineage as anybody, you know, I mean, yeah. And they just squandered it. There's ways to build for the future and still respect your past. And WCW never did that. Yeah. And I think in a way they kind of turned off those longtime fans that in many ways were generational fans Yeah, over just some of the silly nonsense. Mm -hmm. And these are people that I don't think have ever picked up a remote and watch pro wrestling again no 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 i would be very interested they, to see they, that they watched they they watched wcw until they didn't watch it anymore and mm -hmm. then they turned it off and i yeah i, I don't think they've ever watched it again no i, Which, I think they were done I mean, I, I mean there is a frankly there is a market for a wrestling style organization to i think still succeed yeah well that's the bill of goods we were promised when um AEW came on the air. Well, yeah. <sighs> I mean, frankly, I think the better bet if you want that for old school wrestling, look to something like what NWA might be able to do. You know, kind of the, the, the studio, but that's, I mean, but that's not nearly the platform that AEW no, has. It's not even the platform that Impact has. No. So, I mean, you know, I think there is a, I mean, I don't know. I think it would be cool to do that style with a more modern spin to it. I think it could still work. Um, I mean, you go back and watch some of those, you know, sh you know some of the anything, Crockett shows, they still hold up. Anything could work now if you had people that fans care about. Yes. Mm -hmm. There is nobody, there's nobody on either show that anybody really cares about. Mm-hmm. Okay, Roman Reigns, allegedly the top babyface in WWE, and I mean a year ago, mm -hmm. comes out and says, "Hey, man, I got leukemia. I got to go away," mm -hmm. and everybody's just like, "It's pretty bad." All right, mm -hmm. next, Bro, dude. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine? Could you imagine the city of Memphis in 1982 or something if Lawler would have come out and said? Hey man, I got cancer. I, I got to take a, you know, a time off of wrestling. Mm -hmm. Dude, they'd have been having vigils in the streets and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. They'd have had a candlelight vigil the next night at the Mid South Coliseum. You yeah. know, it would have, I mean, it, the city would have shut down. And, and I think that's where I think Vince has moved. I don't know if he, he's thinking this consciously or subconsciously. But think about it, every big period he had in his company, the the top star eventually went away and left for Hollywood. Except you know, for Austin. 
except for Austin. You know, he's kind of getting to it a little bit more now. But, you know, The Rock certainly fits that bill. You know, Hogan, I think for a while, looked like he was trying to fit that bill. Yeah. You know, you look at him going away and, you know, but so I think Vince has started to say that maybe rather than building the star that will carry the torch, I want the company to be what people know. Well, and that's, we just, you know, change people. And, and that, to and, me, and he's right. gotten it there and the ratings are, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's like every other week, WWE raw record low viewership, yeah. you know? And, and I think once again, there's nothing pushing Vince. I think Vince is also out. It's frankly past his prime. Oh yeah. On this. Oh I mean, yeah. And the company is so insular that I don't think they really see outside. No. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, Hunter might, but yeah, I, I honestly think WWE might be the most tone deaf fortune, like publicly traded company in the world. Mm. Like yeah. there's probably like, chemical companies poisoning wells that are more socially conscious than <laughs> WWE right now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and I think that's a problem too, is that you have also an era oh of God, Apollo, Apollo Cruz. Yeah. He's, oh God. he's coming down with a remake of the Kamala gimmick, except he's not a cannibal. Yeah. Well, that helps. Yeah. He's, but he's coming. To, it's a, it's I mean, what, like, they don't have Tony Atlas to, to put an African garb. God, this is a black guy coming down with a spear. Yeah, it, it is my understanding. Isn't he? I think he does have Nigerian lineage, though. Cruz says, I think he did this kind of on the independence from what I read, but it's still like, yeah. All right. It I, doesn't I got a Apollo Cruz. Let's see. He started in 2009 under the name Uha Nation. Okay, wait a minute. He was born in Nigeria. Okay, well, that works then. Do they- I mean, it, be- it beats giving Kofi Kingston a Jamaican accent. I had to stop myself because I almost said a word that would have got us kicked off of YouTube, but this is 2021. Do they carry spears in Nigeria now? I don't know. I don't think so. I, I mean, where was it? This says where he was born. Once again, even with that, the idea of him embracing his Nigerian roots isn't bad. But the idea that we still think people in Africa carry spears. Like and yeah. not isolated tribes somewhere. We're talking about like, does Vince actually think like? So wait, this this right? doesn't even make any sense. Because in one part it says he was born in a state I'm not going to try to pronounce in Nigeria, but in the other one it says he was born in Sacramento. So are they working us or what? I want to say I read somewhere that he does have actually Nigerian lineage. So, I mean, that does and, work. Okay. You know? If he was born in this particular part of Nigeria that it claims he was born mm-hmm. in, it says the population's 4 million people. All this, carrying spears. Y- yeah. You know, do you think they have saying, a spear? Do you think in Nigeria they have like public debates about spear control? Well, I mean, like you can't have the spear with a certain grip. You know, you can't have the automatic spear. You, you, you know, things like that. The spear, you can have the spear of this clip, but not that clip. But these are things I wonder about. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe. So it sounds like his dad was from there, but I can't. It, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know where he was born okay so maybe he is like really nigerian but again yeah <sighs> well and why, also why the, does this guy come out on nigeria why, why does he come out on wwe tv randomly speaking in an accent mm-hmm. unless i mean okay you can play that off mm-hmm. you know you could find a reason for that okay um what's his name is it, um 
is Gary Gary Oldman? Is he the one that played Commissioner Gordon on yes. Batman? Yes. Mm-hmm. He's English, mm-hmm. British. He wasn't speaking British English in that movie. No. So, if if, if you want to play this, that okay, he's and, and maybe they did, and I just haven't seen it. But like, yeah. I was actually faking talking like an American because yeah. idiots don't want to hire me if I use my real accent. So I went to school to learn how to speak like you, boof- you doofuses. Mm-hmm. Okay. But otherwise, he just shows up speaking with an accent. Honestly, you could take some of what they did with Muhammad Hassan back in the early 2000s and it would actually work with this i mean can you imagine he comes out and cuts a promo and says that for years for me to try to get over i had to be like you i had to talk like you i had to act like you i had to forget who i was to try to get over and what did it get me nothing yeah you you cut that promo it's a heel promo but man the best heel promos are always true they are true best heels always have you look at it from a slightly different perspective they're right that to me is always the effect of heels but again the spear yeah no the spear spear. totally kills him because it makes him into a parody it doesn't make him a serious it it makes him into kamala except i mean in 1982 people didn't know about uganda right (laughs) it's not like now where i mean yeah you know the only thing you had about Uganda in 1982 was if you went to your school library and saw whatever was in the world book, right? About Uganda. I mean, they showed Kamala in mind. I mean, so that, so that was it, right? But, yeah. I mean, now we we actually know these things. We've seen this. And, you know, we, we know they're not just cannibals who paint their face yeah. and walk with spears, right? And have handlers in a, in a pith helmet and a mask. Yeah. I mean, and it's also this idea that somehow Africa does not have like a distinct, vibrant culture, depending on where it is. Yeah, like all of Af- Africa is not a country, folks. It's no, a it's broad not. collection of civilizations no, and not. cultures. Like, I honestly think, like Vince, if you ask him, what's the difference between you know Nigeria and Uganda? Oh. I don't know, pal. You know? I don't know, pal. I don't know. I don't think he knows. No, he probably couldn't pick him out. Okay. I'm not going to stand here and pretend I could tell you exactly where Nigeria and Uganda are on a map. But I at least know they're two separate things. I could get you in the reasonable portions of Africa where they are. Mm-hmm. Anyway, back to this, um, this death of WCW. Yeah, really. Uh, Shane Helms and Chavo Guerrero in the match of the night really weird seeing shane helms in like normal attire well once again two great workers yep you know i mean you're telling me those guys in a form of wcw could not be useful in the next couple years after 2001 absolutely you're telling me chavo couldn't have had a tag team run with somebody helms couldn't have had a tag team run with somebody or for sure as cruiserweight champions even or even u.s champs or cruiserweight tag champs that they just (laughs) crowned tonight there you go yeah, I mean, it's like, once again, you're looking, and actually, you know, now that I'm looking back at it at first, I was like, man, this roster kind of sucks. But now I'm looking at it, I'm like, there's some pieces you, you could, could use do here. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of people who were wasted for a long time. Yeah. Um, Shane Helms had his own troop of dancers. I wrote down that I thought one of them looked like Gail Kim, and I thought <laughs> one of them looked like Trish Stratus. Um, I had forgotten what Trish Stratus was doing during this particular time, which we saw on Raw or on on Nitro that was simulcasted with yeah with Raw. Um, anyway, th- I I thought this was a decent match, probably the match of the night. Yeah. Oh, and a uh, real stellar one here: Buff Bagwell and Lex Luger. Um. Mm-hmm. Buff Bagwell, I think, is right at 30 at this mm-hmm. point and um, is already looking rough. Yeah. Uh, Luger actually looks 
pretty good to be, mm -hmm. I think, 43-ish. And this could, I mean, even there, the idea of taking a younger guy and, and pairing him with Luger, you know, if you had Luger primarily as a tag guy, I think he could squeeze a couple years of life out of him still. Oh, yeah. I mean, he had a decent look. He had a name. He had, you know, but he could also be a guy that gets somebody over. Mm -hmm. Like, once again, when you get these guys to get to a certain age, pair them with somebody to get over. Yeah. You know, either and give them the rub or have the screw job on them or they turn on them or whatever. But, you know, you could have, there's so many ways you could write this that would have worked. Yeah. Um, now obviously, yeah, just about two years from this point in time, Lex Luger, yeah, I'm thinking he hits rock bottom. Yeah. Yeah, because that's that's when he had Liz overdose in his house. Come, come, coming to a dark side of the ring near you. Yeah, surely that's got to be one of the episodes they're going to do. Yeah. But anyway, Buff and Luger against Sean O'Hare and Palumbo. There's not anything to say. It went about a minute. And once again, O'Hare and Palumbo aren't bad. Mm -mm. No, They've got I mean, good looks. Palumbo I mean, had a good run, a decent run. Yeah. In WCW or um, WWE. I, it just are you telling me that with the right marketing somebody like o'hare couldn't have gotten over with his look and i mean everything oh yeah bad sure. looking guys you know i mean they had the prototypical look that you know yeah try to push them you know um next match we have canyon against the cat ernest miller Ernest Miller, 15 years ahead of his time, wearing a Somebody Call My Mama yes. t-shirt. Interesting enough, that theme was actually used for him in WWE. And then later was nice. recycled to Brodus Clay. Nice. So, and you know, actually, I was thinking about this the other day. The whole lead up to Brodus Clay is like this monster heel that's like murdering people with his bare hands. Mm -hmm. And then he comes out as the Funkasaurus. <laughs> like... I mean, I like funk as much as anybody, but with dancing girls. Really? This is what we did with him? With a yeah. look like that? Like, <laughs> how do you ever walk back from that when you're a comedy act? Obviously, like, comedy. Yeah. I mean, that would be like all of a sudden one day taking Santino Morella and make him like a stone cold killer in the ring, like snapping arms left and right. Yeah. Like, once you put somebody in that box, they're not coming out. No. No. That's why Jim Carrey's serious movies have bombed. People don't, yeah, people don't want to see Jim Carrey as a except for guy. the serious movie where he is portraying the life of a comedy actor. Right. Yeah. Did featuring you, way, Jerry did you, Lawler. Did you ever? By the way, did you ever watch the documentary? I think it was on Netflix or Hulu about Jim Carrey about how far he got in that role, mm -mm. like that he was actually staying in character, and there were people at the set that weren't really sure is he just staying in character or is he like gone off the deep end where he's actually thinking he's Andy Kaufman right now? Mm, nice. Like that was, that's actually a really good documentary, but I mean, I haven't seen that one. I mean, the, actually there's one, there's one of the hottest angles in wrestling history coming out of Memphis. Yep. Yeah. Got him on David Letterman in New York. Yeah. Well, and I think also, I, I, if I remember right, Kaufman first pitched it to, I want to say Vince senior. Yeah. He did. And Vince was like, I don't get it. But yeah. I, I don't I don't, I don't do get this. this. And then you bring Kaufman into Memphis. Oh my God. He just wrote, you know, you leave a genius like Kaufman and you it's give just, him a target like Memphis. Yeah. Oh my God. Like, you know, I want to know how many teams of writers it took to give Andy Kaufman his promos. One. Yeah, a guy named Andy Kaufman. Yeah, he came <laughs> up with him on himself. They probably said, hey, Andy, you got three Yo, minutes. Yo, bunch of your watching your wrestling. That's awesome. <laughs> you know. And then Bill, I love, like, what was it, World Intergender Wrestling Champion? Yes, the World Intergender Wrestling Champion. No, that's actually the t-shirt I want. Next live pro wrestling event I go to, that is yeah. the t-shirt I'm wearing. And I want to see how many people in the audience get, get the reference. Like, yeah. you know, what? and I'll say it right now. If you get the reference, you can tell me what it is. I will give you at the wrestling event I am at. If you know what I'm wearing, I will give you a crisp $20 bill. <laughs> a $20 you know, bill. Come up to me and say, this is what it's about. I'll you have to mention this podcast, though. 
you have to mention the podcast, or what I will do is get out a basketball. And if you can dribble it a certain number of times, get the Chris $20 bill. And then at the last, I kick it away from you. <laughs> okay, million dollar man. You know. So. <sighs> Booker and T. And also, you know, think, also think about, you know, actually million dollar man. Another example of using a well-rounded African-American character in <laughs> WWF history. Yes. Virgil. The manservant. Yeah, exactly. Ages well, really does. Yeah. But hey, he got a lot of meat sauce money. He did. And he, I mean, at least he, he got, you know, the revenge on DiBiase at the end. Nowadays, they just drop it. Yeah. And he'd never, you know, and actually, never get you know, I mean, as much as we make fun of Virgil, He's pro- he's had a he's had a better career than a lot of people are going to give him credit for. I me, mean, he was in some yeah. big time angles, yeah, he and was. even when he went face against DiBiase, that had people invested. Yeah, they I mean, actually, see it. that's what when he when he goes over DiBiase, I thought Rowdy, you know, Roddy Piper did an excellent job on commentary for that, selling mm-hmm. it like this is a big deal, and I mean, and this wasn't a main event. You know, it well, was the a, people in the crowd. I mean, that was Madison Square Garden. They were going yeah, crazy. Going nuts in that match, you know, and and that shows that with the right story, you can get the people behind you. They, but like yeah. you said, they have to care about you. In that moment, yep. people cared about Virgil, and fans don't care about moves; they care about people. Yeah, <sighs> moves are a means to tell the story. Mm-hmm. The story is the biggest thing of all you know and and that's what i think we're getting into that you know you have so many guys that can do so many crazy things in the ring yeah never we probably had better athletes in wrestling than what we do today Mm -hmm. but that's but then again athletes are not necessarily pro wrestlers not saying pro wrestlers aren't athletes but there's a there's the physical aspect to it yeah frankly to get over there's nobody that's ever gotten over in wrestling history just because they were good in the ring. No. A lot um, of them, if you were awesome in the ring but didn't have a personality and couldn't talk, you're a jobber. Yeah. That's how you become George South, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Steve Lombardi. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, obviously, you need those jobbers to get guys over. But, you know, I think without the personality, without the ability to talk and to get that connection with the crowd, you're never yeah. getting over. I don't care what you do. Yeah, I don't care how many flips you do. Okay, that was cool. Now what? <laughs> okay, that was cool. Yeah, now you're right. Uh, speaking of a match that didn't have too many moves, Booker T against Rick Steiner. Mm-hmm. Rick Steiner, current uh, school board member and real estate agent. If you were wondering you know, what he is doing 20 years on. What I would say, honestly, though, this is a match between two Hall of Famers. Yeah, I don't know if Rick is a obviously Hall of Famer. Yeah, but I think, you know, for Steiner's run with the Steiner brothers, mm-hmm. you know, I, and I think this is kind of sad because of Scott. Rick is probably never going to get into the Hall of Fame. Not that it really matters, but yeah. I don't see a day where they put Rick Steiner in. No. I, I just don't see that, which no. is sad because, I mean, for a tag team in their peak, the Steiners were as over as it got. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were one of the best best tag teams ever. I'll tell you, I watched the other night the Steiners against Doom. <laughs> Talk about a stiff match. Yeah, that's a hard hitting match there. Yeah, they were uh, they they weren't messing around in that match. No, they weren't. Um, speaking of a match where I guess it can only be described as messing around, Dusty and Dustin against Flair and Jeff Jarrett. Mm-hmm. I I don't know what do, what do you got to say about it. I think they need star power on the card. Yeah. This is why they're doing it. Obviously, Dustin Rhodes against Jeff Jarrett isn't going to do it. No. So you've got to you've got to bring in Dusty and Flair, which I think speaks to the fact they can't get new guys over. You know, when you've got to trot Flair and Dusty out, that's showing that ultimately you have failed getting these characters over. Absolutely. Yeah, they had nobody new over in you know the whole thing mm-hmm. yeah i don't yeah. know 
Um, and obviously, Dusty does not live up to his promise of Ric Flair's face. Um, but you just end up with whatever you have in the match. I mean, it was decent, I guess. Uh, if only Jarrett would have got to use his guitar one more time. Yeah, and can we just say, actually, Jeff Jarrett, of everything else, he he gave the world a term I still use. Yes, absolutely. Slap Definitely nine. still use that. I still use it 20 plus years after the fact. Oh, yeah. It's right up there with what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah actually, one of our uh, last time I went to a pro wrestling event, the, these crazy times when they had live crowds and yeah, combined it's weird to the weird things. Remember those times? Um, we were all using rotary phones uh, <laughs> and taking the carriage to the wrestling show. Um, but uh, yeah, we were at my buddy Darren and I were at a w, live show in WWE and Hershey. And we actually got a what chant started during uh, one of Buddy Murphy's promos. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And actually, we got, I mean, we were loud. Like, we were loud. This is also in between me, like, yelling, Where's Kamala? randomly. <laughs> like, I was yelling out wrestlers I wanted to see just to confuse the kids. Yeah. And, Who? Yeah. And at one point, all right, this moving on from this, Charlotte's on the show and she does in, the, she does a flare flop in the match because you know the house shows that can mess around a little. I popped yeah. like crazy when she did the flare flop. And, you know, and all of a sudden the kid in front of me asked his dad, who's Ric Flair? Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, my buddy Darren a, had to escort a, me out because he's like, here's a little kid. Yeah, I'm going to put the kid in the figure four and he's not going to walk again. Don't put the kid in the figure four. Put the dad in the figure four for now. Oh, no, dad's to coming him. next. I'm going to break his arm in a car like the horseman. <laughs> you know, but he's got to watch this. You got to yeah. know who Ric Flair is. Yeah, I, I, If I was him, I'd be like, son, we're leaving right now. You are not going to school for the next week and you're going <laughs> to be watching all of Flair's career on the network. Yeah. And then on, I'll pe you... on Peacock now. Yeah. Have yeah, you switched? No. I, I don't I don't think I will actually. Wow. Uh, they well here's the thing I was reading. Like there, I don't know how much programming is gonna be coming over. Yeah. Do it. And also, I mean, have you been hearing like how they've been editing stuff out? I, I heard they took I've heard they took a little bit out. They they took out the Roddy Piper blackface from yeah. WrestleMania. I don't know. I just I I mean if they think that's bad. Wait until they start getting it. I mean, supposedly they have like 17,000 hours of content they have to review. Yeah. Just wait till you get a Ric Flair 1986 promo going on. Let's see how well yeah. that ages in the Me Too era. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. I mean, that, that, like, I mean, that's the thing. If I lose that, I mean, frankly, I, I use the network to watch old wrestling. Yeah. And if I don't get the old wrestling, I don't know if I'm going to keep it. Like, yeah, I, I might, I might do it. I heard they're giving it away for, um i think ten dollars for like four months that's not too shabby and i mean actually there are some things on peacock that's probably worth having yeah like other shows you get and things but yeah i don't know i mean i'll say i've not watched much wrestling during the pandemic it's just no i haven't i hardly into it, you know yeah I, I don't i mean i've watched the pay-per-views i watched the rumble i watched elimination chamber i didn't watch whatever this mm -hmm. terrible thing they had last Here's week what i don't get your your aew you know what why didn't you get the saturday at 605 time slot and rebuild that yeah like that is like the most like you, i don't know i there are people of a certain age that if you just say 605 wrestling they know, they know what you're talking about yeah wrestling you know what i mean i think that would be cool to bring that back you know like 605 on saturdays you know wrestling yeah yeah like that's what we call wrestling at 605 yeah like and i'll tell you what you would have a lot of people in their 40s and 50s who haven't watched wrestling in 20 30 years that they saw wrestling's back at 605 on a on a former turner affiliated station yeah they're gonna check out a couple episodes at least do you think they would make it a couple episodes i think they well depending on how they book the shows if it was ridiculous crap, no. But if you actually, you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe show like an Oli and Arn match in the middle of it, even though they don't That's own true. the rights to it. You know, but <laughs> even though they don't own the rights. Who cares? They, they have the rights to Georgia, don't they? 
I don't know if they do. I thought Vince just. Mm. Well, like Georgia champion. Okay, well, I guess we look back. Georgia Championship Wrestling gets bought by Vince. That's true. He then sells it back to Crockett. Did did that then get rolled over in the WCW sale? Did he Turner bought it from? In so that was eighty four, right? Yeah. Did he have the the forethought in nineteen eighty four to say, "I want the rights to all the tape library"? Now he did. So that may just be hanging out out there. For it probably got rolled over. If it's even whoever. if it's in existence. I mean, you got to think about the quality yeah. of the tape right now too. I mean, you're looking early eighties for that stuff. Yeah. You're you're talking some serious age now. I mean, if, if they're like legitimate master tapes that have been mm-hmm. stored well, they're fine. They should be okay. Yeah. Part of the issue that, that, that you have when you're watching these tapes that you see online is that this is like they were recording on like the six hour yeah. time setting on these VCR tapes. And then it probably set up in somebody's attic for 10 mm-hmm. or 15 years, just baking. And that's, you know. That that's why you get that horrible video quality with like heroes of wrestling. Right. Although, let's be fair, that just sort of adds to the ambiance of that well, show. Yeah. I mean, really, do you want that to be a technical classic? Is that really what you want in your world? I don't. <laughs> I don't. 4K would not make that show age well. It might be worse. worse it might be worse if you saw it in 4K. I think if they did that, we might see parts to Jake Roberts we don't want to see, and we're not talking about the snake folks. No, well, he had on some really baggy sweatpants. Well, you know, that could, that could have gone sideways real quick, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, it could have. But, anyway. I mean, this is, like, once again, though, I think wrestling, this just shows wrestling is a very simple business, actually. It's really not complex. No. And I think that's no. why wrestling has worked for as long as it has. And... And I think it's why it'll always continue to work. It's just, I think we've moved away from that, from the yeah. storytelling that you just, you don't get anymore. Um, these long builds that, you know, I mean, for gosh sakes, we talked about here, we had the last pay-per-view in WCW history and we're bringing out Flair and Rhodes who have had a legitimate rivalry pushing 20 <laughs> years by that point. And some of the biggest matches in wrestling history. And they're still, yeah. using that, you know, yeah. I mean, first time ever on wcw pay-per-view yeah tony shivani said yeah and last for, for, and last yes you know i wonder when when they were sitting there for this program i mean did, did they know how much did tony and those guys that okay yeah this this is this is coming to an end you know from what i've read and i've heard i think a lot of them didn't really know until they got to the nitro that day and I think they finally saw the WWE people there. They were kind of like, wait a minute, what's going on here? But even oh. then, I don't think they necessarily thought that this is going to be the end of things. It might yeah. be repackaged. It might be, you know, I don't think anybody thought this was going to be the final WCW pay-per-view and there's never one after that again. Yeah. I don't well, think anybody and, came to the room thinking that. And the thing is, I think at this point, and even to the nitro that they did the next night, I think these guys were there on the assumption that that group that Eric Bischoff was leading Mm -hmm. was going to buy the thing and that they were going to stay on TV. And then sometime in between that, that second to last nitro last thunder taping and the end of the week, that's when um turner or i mean time warner aol time warner comes out and says yeah we, we don't want wrestling on the tv anymore yeah and at that point bischoff's like uh okay well um this deal that i had going was mm-hmm. based on having tv and if we don't have tv uh yeah and and here is a here's another scenario had just the timing been right and the technology there if you're bischoff you say i'll buy the tape library yeah well i don't and i'll make it an online subscription service for the time being almost like a network i don't know if bischoff on his own 
had the cash to do that. I think the group he had certainly did. And yeah, but I think the group was trying to have a wrestling show. Yes. And then they ended up not having a network for this wrestling show. Well, and I think too, what you could have had at this period, had the internet been bigger and the technology been there, the internet could have been your lifeline for a little bit. Yeah. Well, maybe because how many, I mean, Hey, how many times we watched OVW on YouTube? You know, you're, you're telling me you can't have Nitro on YouTube. You know, I mean, you could there. It just it, the timing was off. And also I've read there might have been some shady inside dealings at Turner with some people that had connections to people with Titan. And, mm. you know, all of a sudden the TV deal gets yanked at the last minute that basically kills the price. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, I mean, because I think I think it was Chris Jericho said, had I known what Vince bought it for. I would have bought it. I mean, that's it. So we're not talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars getting thrown around. Here. Oh, no, they they got it for little to nothing. And I mean, talk about an investment they have more than made their money back on. Just on the network. Yeah. Like, or the ability to sell a Ric Flair t-shirt. Mm-hmm. Dusty or a Dusty Rhodes t-shirt. t-shirt. Like, I mean, there's your money right there. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. And that's the thing, too. I mean, say we want. Vince did all right with his peacock deal. Billion dollars, right? Yeah. Or is it is it more than that? I'll take the billion. Yeah, it's something <laughs> huge. You know, I mean, you look at it right now. Vince is set more than set for life with the Fox deal and the Peacock deal. Yep. And once again, if he's making more money than he ever has, why put out a good product? Yeah. You know, it was the theory they used to joke up the Chicago Cubs. They used to be horrible year after year, but they still sold out regularly every game. So if you're the company that yeah. owns them, why put talent out in the field? We're going to sell it out whether we're in first place or last. True. You know? I mean, it's the money that counts. And yeah. So Well, and I mean, let's be fair. He got that billion dollars from Fox when Raw was already in the nosedive. I mean, he well, got that in 2018. I would have loved to have been in the room when Vince pitched that. Like, I would love to have heard the pitch they used to somehow get a billion dollars out of Fox. Yeah. With the numbers they had. Like, that, like. Well, I mean, you know, it's 52 shows worth of programming every year for yeah. um, five years, or was it four? Whatever, it doesn't matter. You know, I, I don't know. Would, would it be, and two hours a piece. So would it be cheaper for them to run a different show Mm -hmm. to run four 30 minute shows at, you know, 52 weeks of brand new content for four years. So I, you know, well, and you know, actually all of this, this Peacock deal made me start thinking of something that I never thought I would say. I wonder if Vince would be open if the money is right to sell wwe if you had somebody come with a crazy offer i think it would have to be bigger than like anybody else it would have to be the biggest deal in sports entertainment but if somebody came to vince i think he'd listen and i don't think we could say that 10 15 years ago no i think he no, would at I don't least think we could i think he would want it in the contracts that you know somehow the royalties mm-hmm. he'd want some kind of deal paid out you know probably <laughs> for quite some time for the kids Mm -hmm. i'm sure he wouldn't care about the wrestlers um although um i don't know if i brought this up to you did you hear about the deal that um uh bill nye got the science guy from yeah from disney no so they had him he had some kind of a deal with Disney and then they started putting his stuff up on, I guess, Disney plus and they cut his royalties severely and he took them to court mm-hmm. and basically they said something to the effect of, okay, in this particular case, you don't have standing to ask for what you're asking for, Mm -hmm. but 
that royalties should be being paid mm -hmm. on streaming content. Yeah. Whereas now it's not. You used to get money for the DVDs, and Cornette talks mm -hmm. about that a lot. You used to get money for DVD sales and all that, and now well, you don't hardly you get anything. Also, what I look at, it's probably not a – Yeah, you think about even – 10 years ago you're making money off pay-per-view you're making money off merchandise I, you're not getting those pay-per-view checks like you used to get no you're not you know i mean it's i don't know i think you you look at that and i'm just worried that a more corporate non-wrestling entity is gonna so just gut what was the network i mean there was great stuff on the network never yeah, in a million and... years would i think that you'd be able to watch half of what you could watch and I don't know if we'll still have that. I think we might be looking back fondly at the period from 2014 to 2021. Yeah. Golden era of streaming wrestling. So here's. I forgot what I was going to say. Let's talk about this final main event of this pay-per-view. And then I'll see if I can remember what I was going to say. Scott Steiner against DDP. Mm -hmm. Um. Scott Steiner was not exactly the most mobile person, even by this time. And uh, I suppose this is the final appearance of Michael Buffer. Oh, yeah. On WCW. Mm -hmm. Main event ring announcer. You know, there's Paige. There's another guy that in the right storyline could have been the guy to kill the NWO. Oh, for sure. I mean, think about the pop he got when he had the NWO shirt on and Hall and Nash thought he joined and then diamond cutters everywhere. Yeah. That pop was real, man. Like the roof blew off that place. And yeah. There's a homegrown WCW talent. Yep. And just another, you know, another guy that kind of got over organically on his own. Mm -hmm. And then know? just ended up getting wasted when he goes to WWE because yeah. everybody did except for maybe Booker. Yeah, but even then, there's some stuff of Booker T that you look back and you're like, oof. You know? I heard that the clip with him and McMahon was one of the things that got cool. by NBC. Well, and then the uh, the promo before the WrestleMania match with Triple H keeps calling Booker T boy. Oof. Yeah, like, oof. come on, folks. Like, you know, that didn't age well when they did it. Like oh, that didn't like, age well the next day. No, that was already old, you know. And I mean, I think that's where, like, a the the weird thing with wrestling is wrestling's always had the ability to kind of be, and I don't mean outlaw in the sense of like an outlaw territory, yeah, but that there's a that there's an edge to pro wrestling, all right. And and I think that's where if it gets more corporately controlled, I don't know if you're gonna have that. I mean, how many edgy Fortune 500 companies do you know? How much edgy stuff do you honestly see in AEW? Nothing. I mean, that's the number two promotion. Yeah. You're not seeing anything edgy there. No, I will say AEW has maybe been one of the bigger disappointments out there. I know there's people that love it. I get that. I mean, but for me, you would think we would be the prime demographic for aew people that are maybe not totally sold in the wwe product lifelong wrestling fans that like story driven wrestling with good action if that's what they need to do yeah but we don't live in basements <sighs> that's very true we don't live in basements um God, I, was gonna, I was gonna say something else but another one that would have got us it, it reminds me of the uh, have you heard the, the song they play on Cornette's show the one that's at the like, end yeah, yeah, Meltzer says them in the key demo. Yeah, that song always cracks me up. I think we can't yeah. we can't quote it because it's a family show. But <laughs> no, there's there's a lot of lines in that. But but you know, I mean, and this is the thing too that like, I know Cornette is a very polarizing figure in the wrestling world, but a lot of what he's saying about the current product, I don't know if you can necessarily fault him for it. I mean, he's, well, they try. Yeah, they, they try, but I mean, vilified by everybody. Meltzer apparently told somebody to go die. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow, that escalated quickly. Yeah, um, it did. But 
if you're going to criticize Kevin Kelly, just go die. Now, oh. now if you're going to do that, now what you do is you put that death match in the Tokyo Dome, and it'll be like 20 stars. 20 stars. The star rating system has no upper limit. <laughs> That was what he said. The other well, see, day. if I was a pro wrestler, I would run with that. Like my post match interview, they'd be like, "What would you give that match? I'd give that thirty two stars, brother." Brother, you know, be like, "How you rate that's fifty two stars all night, all night, all night." You know, and just like, you know, or like, or even go out and have a crappy match, and just walk back to the ring saying 13 stars, thirteen stars." You know, <laughs> like, I mean, mock it. I mean, that's what I would do. But yeah, well, yeah. But the problem is you have wrestlers going out there that are basing what they do in the ring on how the smart fans are going to rate it. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if that's necessarily the right way of going. It should be what draws the biggest audience in, not like the hardcore one. Yeah. But, yeah, it's – and I mean, I think – The NFL wants – more viewers Mm -hmm. they don't cater everything to the ones that are already watching no well you know what think about like what the nfl's been doing you know people are calling the nfl has gone soft you know what i don't know about other people but i'm not really wanting to go over the middle as a wide receiver on nfl field anytime soon no like call it soft all you want but man they're not playing soft and i think want to People want to see football. We don't want to watch and see people get maimed. Right. That's the difference. Like, I really like, like, even like when you see a guy tear at his knee, the sickening feeling that you have for just watching it. Yeah. Like, it's like, just. It, it's the same thing with like car racing. Like, oh, the cars are too safe. No. Well, <laughs> I've never watched car racing because I wanted to see somebody get killed. Yeah, really. But I have seen races where guys got killed. Yeah. You know, and you know what? 2001, talk about even though it's the year we graduated high school, yeah, kind of a craptastic year. Everybody, that was not a good year. I'm actually looking back on, I mean, yeah, you brought back Dale Earnhardt, Mm -hmm. WCW dies, yeah, we had 9 11, (laughs) yeah, you know, that was a big one, you know, like man, 2001 sucked, 2001 was pretty bad, man. It's fitting this pay per view is a 2001 pay per view. Yeah, it is. This two, you know what? This pay per view symbolizes everything that 2001 was. Yeah, because you 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 go to the next Nitro. Um, I don't know who won. Oh, Scott Steiner won that match. For anybody who's concerned about that, he had the worst Steiner recliner I've ever seen. To where, like, neither one of them obviously cared about anything at that point. You know, this is the sad thing about Steiner, like. 10 years ago from this point what scott steiner could do in the ring oh good grief like the frankensteiner was the most over move in wrestling revolutionary to be that big i mean like you look at that big you're like oh my god like and but see now a frankensteiner you see him in like every match now every uh, every match it's not special so you know it's but yeah there's a guy that did not age well physically injuries mounted on him you know he was not the scott steiner that you know he once was no not at all did you watch the last nitro too yeah yeah i went back and watched that and obviously you have the promo from vince to start it i don't have any notes on this one i just watched it promo from vince to start it on and then booker t has to win the first match because bookers <laughs> signed the deal to go work for vince and mm-hmm. scott didn't he decides he's just going to take that turner money for as long as they'll keep it coming you blame him <laughs> not when you're at his level i mean booker yeah. t well, yeah booker probably needed to take the deal and go work but you know steiner had been around at that point for long enough that you know well, and also A lot of these guys, imagine coming from the WCW level of work you had to do year-round compared to even a 2001-2002 WWE schedule. And it's night and day. If I I can draw this money and not have to do that. Not have to be on the road 300 days a year. And this is the problem is that for a lot of these guys, they were making that guaranteed money, and Vince was not willing to budge on dates. Yeah. I mean, you talk about what could have been the greatest angle in wrestling history, the invasion. Yeah. 
And, you know, to me, if I was Vince, I said, I don't care how much money it is. Back up the truck. Yeah. I need Goldberg. I need Flair. I need Hogan. I need Hall. I'll I just, need- I'll, I'll, I'll just take the contracts. Yeah. And you know what? I you would have everybody. had that invasion pay-per-view with those people probably outdrawing WrestleMania. Yeah. Like, it, it's already the biggest non mania pay-per-view ever. And and see, here's the difference. The invasion works with some of those bigger names. Which, I mean, we talk about WCW did not bring up those new guys, but when they tried to insert some of these same guys we see in the pay-per-view and on this show, yeah. they look like chumps compared to the WWF guys. Yeah. And granted, part of that's booking in the way they put them out there. But, yeah. you know, I mean, people aren't, oh, my God, Chuck Palumbo's in the ring. Yeah, no, no, nobody oh was. Oh, my God, Goldberg is in the ring. Yeah. Yeah, no, you know, you know nobody was caring about most of the guys that they brought over. You know, no, no and, disrespect to Tommy Dreamer or any of those guys, but he was not the people that you wanted to see going into invasion and what i think too i mean you people knew those names people didn't when you think wcw you don't think sean o'hare you don't think chuck palumbo you don't think no. sean stasiak that's it's like sting rick yeah. flair dusty the nwo i mean goldberg pop you would have gotten if you're having an undertaker promo the lights go out and all of a sudden repelling from the ceiling is sting yeah like out of nowhere just you know what go ahead book it make your money in in 2001 that match would have oh my god 2011 that match would have oh yeah Yeah, even 2011 it would have been incredible i mean you would have had essentially icon against icon of these two separate companies even in 2000 what was it 15 yeah that he came back i that to me still is the worst yeah. thing they ever bungled okay so all right you you don't want sting and the undertaker to go in a singles match we get it put them in a tag match mm-hmm. because that place will come unglued mm-hmm. when those two guys finally get in the ring and you you milk it however you got to milk it and you get those two guys in the ring and that place is going to go crazy would have had the same reaction when you had that build up to wrestlemania six when Warrior and Hogan finally were in the ring together. Yeah. Like you watch that, the rumble moment, and you hear the it, the crowds building and building yep. and building. Oh, oh my God, here they go. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, I mean, you should have had that match. Mm-hmm. You, there's no reason you shouldn't. And frankly, what you got, Sting going against Triple H, dumb. Yeah. I mean, and then the fact that at one point you have the NWO coming out to help Sting. Yeah, why why wouldn't they be coming right. out to beat him up? That's like that's like you know Dusty Rhodes coming out to save Tully Blanchard. Yeah, like, exactly. It, it just didn't make it any didn't sense. Make any even, sense at all? And even you have DX coming out to help Hunter, which you get there, you know. But you got a cheap pop for that, but it didn't. You know, it just wasn't. Yeah, it, it, it had no. It, been. it had no purpose. No. And what you could have had is you could have had a, a Sting Taker feud outside of the actual invasion. It was bigger than the invasion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, actually one you should have held off on. Yeah. You should I mean, have, I would held have off that on having those game. two interact. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, once again, that was where even Vince had all of this talent coming to him. And it came yeah. down to, I mean, I get it comes down to money, but man, you could have had the greatest super cards in wrestling. That said, though, let's be honest. If if he did the thing with Austin that he did at Mania Seventeen, I think he still kills it, just dead. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, okay, if, if you want Austin to turn heel, you've got all these WCW guys. Mm-hmm. He's anti McMahon anyway. Mm-hmm. So it does make sense that this guy that's been against Vince forever is going to still be against Vince in, you know. Yeah. I mean, it, it just didn't, I mean, yeah, there was talk about at one point having Hogan and Austin in a match. Eventually that went to the rock. 
Yeah. And, and I don't know, you know, and I don't know, frankly, if Austin and Hogan could have had that same style match. No, I don't, think I don't know if it would have been the same classic that we have today. And because I think the rock was smart enough to realize what was going on in the ring. I think Austin would have been too, but the two styles worked. Yeah. You know, and, and then again, turning Austin heel, that's just so stupid anyway. At that but, point. Yeah. There's no need to if, do that. If you want to have him continue being anti McMahon. Mm-hmm. Now that's another thing where you still have Vince coming to him on that, the, the show Mm-hmm. where vince is like begging him to come back and he he swindles vince for a couple of weeks okay i would like Vince you know, just throw vince is like steve i'll give you anything you want mm-hmm. millions of dollars houses whatever you want steve I'll, I'll give it to you i need you to come back and then steve gets the money from him and then he turns his back on him and he comes out the next night haha <laughs> vince those checks cleared their mind baby and then what i would love to see is the wcw guys come out to him and then all of a sudden Austin's like, I don't like you either. You guys <laughs> screwed me over a couple of years ago. Yeah. Remember that when I got that FedEx to my house, you know, like <laughs> voice and, mail. Some, and you could have somehow had Bischoff show up then. Yeah. Like that. See, once again, these are, we're not professionals here, folks, but you know, this is spend the money. Yeah. I mean, there's still saying to make money. You, you got to spend money. That was the whole thing to go back to AEW. Mm-hmm. I knew exactly where AEW was going the minute I heard that they didn't pay punk. The yeah. Instant I heard that they did not pay CM Punk, whatever it took, whatever mm-hmm. it took to get him in there. Mm-hmm. Because, Look at it right now. If because, you would have imagined the Hall of Famer coming out is punk. You will have him all of a sudden the opening chords of cult of personality hit. But see, now, now that would not have the same effect. I, you know, I think there's still enough fans that would remember punk. They, there are, there are, but yeah. here's the thing. I think Vince knew exactly what he was doing when he got Fox to spend mm-hmm. nothing on um, that the thing to get him coming back All right little right. pause there anyway th- this last episode of nitro what what do you i mean obviously none of these matches were classics mm-hmm. and they weren't meant to be they had to get the belts on certain people mm-hmm. and off of certain people to see where they were going to go with it and obviously you have booker t coming over with both mm-hmm. both of the main singles belts um I don't see the cruiserweight championship on here. So who, who had that? That was Helms, right? Yeah. So obviously we know he came over and um, yeah. Then you had the cruiserweight tag championship and it, did they even, I don't think they even did anything with that in WWF. Did they, no. they just killed it. Yeah, another. I mean, obviously, you have to have Flair and Sting. It's got to be on the. That match has to be on the show. Oh yeah, just for history's sake. Yeah, and and I think that is. uh, That's actually one of the sort of saddest things of WCW, where you have Flair out here wrestling in a t-shirt. Yeah. You know. Well, it just it sums up what it once was and what it was at the end. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's actually a good point. It's exactly what it, I mean, what it once was to what it is now. And yeah. And I think it's a, there were so many missed opportunities there. And and it's hard to watch the show, the last nitro now, because we know what happens, you know, in the moment when it's going on, there's still some, it was so fluid. There's so much going on. Nobody really knew, but we know how it ends to me. Yeah. When I got done watching the final Nitro, I was just frustrated for what could have been a golden era of pro wrestling. Oh, yeah. It was totally botched. Yeah. Yeah, that could have been crazy. You know, I mean, could you imagine also back up enough money? Vince is out there, you know, 
WrestleMania, after all this is done, you know, the sale has taken place. Vince is talking, and all of a sudden you hear Bret Hart's music hit. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my God. Like, or just have Hart just show up out of nowhere and beat the crap out of Vince. Yeah. <laughs> just run down. Like, basically make people think, did he is this real? Is this like wait a minute, what's going on here? And this... and and don't tell Jim Ross or the king yeah. what's about to happen. And they're like, what the hell's going yeah. on? That's Bret Hart. Yeah. He's not supposed to be here. Get the cops out here. Yeah. I mean, I have him like beat the holy crap out of Vince. Like, and I mean, it would have been, and you could have booked those two in a no holds barred match. And it could have probably were now Brett was still dealing with the concussion issues, but I think if you, yeah, I don't think at that point he had had his stroke yet. Yeah. I don't think he had the stroke. He had the concussion. I think that happened a lot later. Yeah. But I mean, probably I think because he, he didn't fully heal from the, you could have probably found a way to make concussion. that work with those yeah. guys, you know? Um, but I mean, there was so much you could do that just, you look at it, the talent that was there, the matches you could have had, the factions you could have had. I mean, could you imagine a horseman against DX? Yeah. A that version of the horseman against, you know, I mean, that would have been, that would have been awesome, you know? Yeah, there's yeah, so I mean, many I, missed opportunities here. Like, and I mean, actually, you think about it. At that era, the opening match of one of these shows that we could do the fantasy booking on, some of these opening matches could very well have sold, have been main events at oh, certain yeah. times. That card would have oh, yeah. been so stacked that it doesn't matter where you go on the show. It's 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 and awesome. if if they brought everybody in, can you imagine the 2002 Royal Rumble? Oh my God! Yeah, I mean where you've got Eddie and Sting and Nash and Hall and Hogan and all the good grief. I mean, that would have been unbelievable. Yeah. To bring all these guys in. And you could have even used the rumble as a way to put WCW over as a threat. Yeah. I mean, how cool in Royal rumble WCW guys all of a sudden just work together. Heels and faces. Well, yeah, here, and I mean, we're here, to, by, we're here to destabilize. We're here to destroy. But by that time, you would have already been through the invasion pay per view and all that. I mean, you would have been through four. Um, what I'm saying, you could have maybe into it. They probably would have been smart to hold off a little bit on the invasion, do some things here and there, and then bring it in when they do. You know, yeah. it was I do. I say do it right. Don't do what they did. They got the guys <laughs> that that they could get. Yeah. Rather than spinning for the guys they should have gotten. And, you know, if it takes a little while for that, those time to run out, let it happen and then sign these guys. Yeah. You know, and for some of them, you know, hey, for, for some of these guys, you could say, look, I know, you know, we don't need you to wrestle 300 nights a year. We just need you for certain things. Those guys yeah. would have been okay with that. You know, and then you're not, frankly, clogging up your roster with tons of part timers. You know, you're using them where they need to be, but you're still giving yeah. time to your up and coming talent. You yeah. know, it just, I mean, there was guys that were never going to come over at this point. Jeff Jarrett wasn't going to come over. Luger wasn't coming over. You know, those would be guys that probably would not have been signed. Um, but, yeah. you know, you can survive about Jeff Jarrett and Lex Luger. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Jeff was probably not coming back, but Luger might have. I think still by that point, the way Luger left and then showed up on Nitro, I don't think ever sat well with Vince. It's one of those moments, I think, just, I don't know if Vince has ever gotten over that. Mm, because, yeah, frankly, maybe. Luger is a guy that probably should be in the Hall of Fame and isn't. Yeah. He, he's know. another one of those borderliners. I mean, I think, and, and frankly, right now, with the redemption story the guy has had, man, yeah. I'd, love to see, I'd love to see the WWE documentary on Lex Luger. Yeah, I mean, apparently I mean, he's in a wheelchair. Think yeah, I, I mean, but I think that's that, yeah, such a compelling story pretty... about how rock bottom he hit. Yeah. And really how humbled life made him. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that's a compelling story that, you know, I I would buy it. I'd watch it, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. But that's, but, you know, that's the whole thing is like, where did – where did WCW go? And, and again, I'm like you. I think the, the flair in the t-shirt thing was just so symbolic of the whole thing. 
mm-hmm. that you don't have this guy that was sitting out there in 1986 talking about lizard shoes and yeah. asking Ronnie Garvin, was he going to get on the cover of field and stream and that he's got a half mile long limousine with a yeah. hundred women in it and all that. Yeah. No, you, this, this is, this is 2001 Ric Flair. Who's who's, his his name is still rick flair and he still sort of looks like rick flair but this ain't rick flair it's rick flair name only yeah you yeah know, this, and, this this is not rick flair and i think too well it's also sad watching the show you know as much as we make fun of the wcw production values at times yeah and classic wcw camera work there are a lot of people this is their last night at work yeah yeah, you it know is. I mean? it's their last night of work. Like you think about all the camera crew, all the producers, all the ring crew, you know, people like that. That I don't know. It's just sad seeing all these people that you know behind the scenes are losing their job. Yep. That's not easy to watch. Because I mean, it's one thing a pro wrestler, they'll be fine. But there are people that were working since this was Crockett. Well, Tony Schiavone. Yeah. Yeah. Tony Schiavone was out of wrestling for 18 yeah. years. Yeah. I mean, I don't think he missed it. But no, I mean, I think he, he I mean, was, not sure he was pretty successful. I know he was doing stuff for like one of the Braves minor league affiliates. Yeah, I think doing the like Gwinnett the, team. He was doing like the pre the pregame for I think Georgia. That's not a bad gig to have, yeah. you know, for Georgia football. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you look at some of these people that they they had been working for that company for well over twenty years, and then where do you go? What do you do? Yeah, you know that that's kind of sad to me, um, and. Because I think that's where we often forget about pro wrestling. It's all the people behind the scenes that make this happen. Yeah. You can have people putting out the best promo ever, but if they don't film it right, if they don't hit the right audio, if the timing's off, yep. it, it doesn't go. And Absolutely. And I think that's where, frankly, a lot of the WCW people probably, Vince already had the people he wants. Oh, yeah. I mean, who at WCW would say, oh, we got to have this guy for our production value? Mm-hmm. But you don't. <laughs> he, Vince paid for nothing other than the films yeah he paid for the films and he paid just to say he did yeah oh yeah yeah that's all it was he did it just to say he did and it was also i mean it was kind of the unconquerable even after that he's after events pretty much put out of business every territory but one i mean jim crockett kind of survived even though they sold themselves to turner they weren't jim crockett promotions yeah but there were still, it might as well be Jim Crockett promotions. Yeah. And I've wondered too if it was like reversed, if it was say the AWA that survived in this manner. Let's say Vern sells to Turner. Yeah. I don't know if Vince has this vendetta to end them. I think there's times Vince messed with Crockett just to mess with them. Like, well, no business. This, I mean, he, he did that with Vern too. Oh, yeah. When yeah. he bought Hogan off of him and all that I, mean, I think it was a little bit different because nobody really jim crock was the closest that came to during the rock and wrestling period of kind of going toe-to-toe with vince yeah when we forget about the when we think of the rock and wrestling era there's a lot of good stuff in jim crockett promotions as well yeah like i mean you could talk about the golden era of wrestling might be that mid 80s period oh yeah right there you know oh yeah um, and you know, I think where you had that, they came close, you know, and it just didn't. But then again, you had the fallout from the territories, the people not understanding how to work together, the system. The NWA was in no way capable of handling what happened with Vince. There's just no way to do it. And you also had a lot of, he did at the right time where a lot of longtime promoters were probably just as happy to take the money yeah, and call it a day. You know, they're at yeah, retirement I mean, age, they're, you know... Yeah, they're they're already out. I don't think Vince could have done this in the seventies. No, I don't think he could no. have. I think you would have had way too many of the NWA guys still in their prime and wanting to keep working. And well, um, in in the seventies, there was probably some promoters who would have traveled up to Stamford and Vin, Vin, Vince might be in parts unknown of Jimmy Hoffa right now. He might be in parts unknown. Yeah, I mean, like. And I'm not joking they, around with that either. They like, they might have got one of those, you know, fellows from New York that wears the black leather coats, you know, they yeah, do a little of it. I do a little of this, a little of that. We just don't see Vince Jr. anymore. He's he's just gone one day. What where's Vince at? I don't know. He didn't come to work today. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, and I think that's where Vince also hit the right timing. And also he had Vince was, I won't say Vince, the, the, the narrative is also that Vince was the first to see the power of cable television. Oh no. I, I don't buy that at all. I mean, I think other promoters saw it. It was Vince that was able to actually make it happen. And, you know, I think that's because of where he was. Yes. Being in New York. York, York. He's the, all the networks are there. Mm -hmm. Everybody's there. So whenever he does these things, he's with these network guys. And the most famous arena in the world. Most famous arena in the world is where he runs. Yeah. You know, I mean. I don't care. I mean, it, yeah, I think I'll be interested. Vince was in Minneapolis. Mm-mm. Is he able to? No. If Vince is in Charlotte, I don't think he does what he does. It had to no, be in Denise. And, you know, that was the thing. That's that's the good thing that happened with Crockett is that they got in with um, Turner. Mm-hmm. And I've always wondered what would have happened with them if rather than trying to run – a a real national promotion they had national tv but they still ran a local promotion yeah and i i compare that to nascar racing we brought up earnhardt earlier even up until i mean by 2001 you know it was it was full national but through the 90s when it really peaked in popularity it was still a southern racing promotion it had national tv exposure but it was a southern racing promotion mm-hmm. they went to california a couple times a year mm-hmm. they they went up north a couple times a year and that was it everything else was down in the south it was georgia south carolina north carolina virginia tennessee florida so on it was all down there in the south maybe one trip to texas mm-hmm. everything else was in the south and that's where they were drawing these huge crowds. Mm -hmm. And when they did go to California that two times a year, that was a spectacle. Yeah. But now they tried to go to be this big national Mm -hmm. promotion and it's shot them. You just, you, you end up with stuff that nobody cares about and their, their viewership has gone down to about, you know, 10 to 15 years after it really started in wrestling. Well, I could have in, let's, let's just say 19, I don't know, let's say 1995. I could have probably rattled off to you every driver, their sponsor and their number. Like easily. Yeah. And, and also there was an accessibility of NASCAR then. I mean, for a time I lived in Rockingham, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. I met Davy Allison when I had a Texaco station. <laughs> Sign autograph. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. I saw Bill Elliott in a Quincy's. There's one, kids. Google Quincy's restaurant, everybody. There's one, a blast in the past. Um, but you know, I mean, that was there was accessibility to them. And I think mm-hmm. they made their money in years off of not so much off places like Daytona and Charlotte and Talladega, but places like Rockingham, places like North mm-hmm. Wilkesboro, these yep. smaller places that these small towns would get a taste of the big time. And yeah. you have the same thing. I mean, we talk about the matches they would have had at the West Carteret gym. Yep. These are some awesome cards that were in a gym that we went into regularly. Like, yeah, exactly. You know, um, and, and I think that's the whole thing with, with wrestling again. And I think this is it. It's been exacerbated now mm-hmm. because they can't run anywhere. Right. But, you know, I think that is what has killed people or, you know, mm-hmm killed what goes on is that there's so much less opportunity to see wrestling live Mm -hmm. yeah norfolk virginia they came here they've been here what maybe i think two times since Mm -hmm. i've lived here yeah when crockett was running they were in the scope which is like six miles from my house they Mm -hmm. were in the scope every week maybe every two weeks and you know what if they weren't in the scope you could drive to richmond you could drive to hampton yeah, I mean, they would have been somewhere near you where yeah. you would have seen talent. And and I think, too, I mean, the biggest thing, I think, with Vince, Vince kind of killed kayfabe, which as much as people make fun of it at times, there was a method to the madness. Now, well, it's hard to sometimes separate the people from the characters. 
you know, it's hard for me to think you're this heel when I like, I'll give you a good example, Kevin Owens. It's hard for me to think you're this brutal, psychotic heel when I see you playing with your kids at Disney World. Yeah. Well, and and I've thought for a lot, and we've uh, we've had this discussion, I think, even here before. Mm-hmm. I've thought for a while that they should go to the MMA model mm-hmm. where there's not a heel and there's not a baby face, mm-hmm. but these guys, because the issue is no longer that this guy is going to get screwed over. The issue is that I'm here to show you and everybody else that I'm the best in the world at this. And also I get paid more money Mm -hmm. if I knock you out. And also take away. I mean, one thing with Vince, Vince has always loved his silly, stupid gimmicks. Whereas I think you had it in WCW. You even had it in, in Crockett. But for the most part, your big stars weren't gimmicks outside of Sting. It's Ric Flair. It's Dusty Rhodes. It's Magnum yeah. TA. The difference between Flair in a studio and what you might have seen Flair at a bar at the Charlotte Marriott was not much different. There's no difference. You know? well, and, and, and other, than, other than Flair's writing tomorrow's promo that night at the bar. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know... That's another thing is, okay, yes, in Memphis, yeah, sure, they would have the the zombie or whoever come down to the ring to beat up Jerry Lawler, mm-hmm. but they always played it out like, mm-hmm. who, what, what, what idiot decided to come to to work tonight dressed as a zombie? Yeah, like, yeah. why did somebody come out here dressed as a zombie to get a hold of Jerry Lawler? Mm-hmm. Or, um, or just whatever. But Vince is always like, "No, this is real." Yeah, Bray Wyatt, we set him on fire mm-hmm. in the middle of the ring, and now what? He came back at the thing mm-hmm. for something, and yeah. good for Randy Orton. I hope he's getting a fortune for this. Yeah. It, I mean, it just, once again, like, you could have a Bray Wyatt character in a more realistic model. Yeah. You, know, you could have a legit, is this guy just got to screw loose? And when he goes to work, well, and that's how he gets himself over, you know? That's what you thought for the while with the Wyatt family. Yeah. They made you believe that he was just, okay, this guy's sort of weird. This is but a straight now, cult. Yeah. yeah, you yeah you can believe a cult leader. I mean, we mm-hmm. we had people in a we had a guy in a, a moose hat go into the Capitol building. Um, so you can believe that cults can happen. Um, yeah, you know, but they're expecting me to believe that this guy can get hit in the face with a sledgehammer and then just pop up. Like, what are we yeah. doing here? And also the reality is very few performers have been capable enough to take some of these gimmicks and make them work. As much as the undertaker is revered on paper, that is a crappy gimmick gimmick was wretched An old West mortician. Really? Gimmick is wretched. Yeah. Let's be honest. That gimmick is wretched. It is just as wretched as the gobbledygooker. But here's the difference. Had no business doing anything. Nobody out, maybe outside of Flair, committed to a gimmick as hard. Oh yeah, as Taker did. Well, I don't think Flair had to commit to it. I think that was him. Yeah, Flair was being Flair. But camera. I mean, as far as like living, I mean, you, th- that's why it's still so weird for me to hear Taker talk in his regular voice. Oh yeah, it still throws me off. The fact that he's doing interviews, the fact that we even have a documentary yeah. behind the scenes of the Undertaker. Yeah. 15 years ago would have never happened. Uh, 10 years ago. Yeah. Wouldn't maybe happened. even five years ago. Yeah. I mean, well, I don't know. How long ago was that match with Roman now? And you know, part of me kind of wishes maybe rather than the access to the take to take her, even though some of the stuff that's come out has been great historically, I kind of would like to have just see him right off in the sunset. Like yeah, just be done. We don't know what happens to him. He just leaves, you know? And I think that would have fit with the character. You know, and you would have had whoever vanquished Taker is the made man now. 
And I, I thought that it should have been. I thought that him and Kane should have done something because obviously Kane has got to be ready to retire yeah. too. I thought they should have done some kind of a casket match where mm -hmm. Taker can lose the casket match, but then something happens afterwards and mm -hmm. some other monster comes down and throws Kane in the casket too mm -hmm. and then sets it on fire. And I mean, even for us, I mean, after WrestleMania 30, did Taker's character really have the same aura he did? No. You know, it, all. and I mean, thing too is, yeah, okay, Brock beats him, but frankly, I hate to say it, it really should have been somebody like Roman Reigns that beats him at that WrestleMania. Oh, it should have been probably anybody other than Brock. Yeah, I mean, it needed to be. Actually, I would take any any member of the Shield at that point. Yeah, need to be one of those guys. Yeah, and man. if you're really thinking that Reigns is going to be our next guy, this is how you do it. You know, and um, but. But, I mean, and that's Brock didn't need that win, but that's where we are after 20 years, 20 years after WCW. And this is where we're sitting that you have no stars. Nope. There are no stars in wrestling. No, there's, and, there... and I think a lot of it, we look at the great stars. They're also your best talkers. I mean, outside oh, yeah. of people we've talked about today, outside of Goldberg, Goldberg was never a great promo. But for what he was, never had to be. He didn't need to be. Andre you know, the Giant I mean, wasn't a great promo. You know, if we talk about okay, some of the all-time greats, Hogan, great on the mic. A Hogan promo is awesome. A Savage promo, a Flair mm -hmm. promo, The Rock, Austin. You know, hell, Sting Michael was, Sting was, Sting was never really known for his mic skills. No, but it, it worked enough. You yeah. know, he was able to get around it. Um, you know, even guys like Michaels and Hart and Triple H, they're mm -hmm. good on the stick. Yeah. You know, New Age Outlaws were great on the stick. You yeah, know, they were. these were the one common denominator is all these guys could talk. Yeah. And frankly, if I wanted to get over as a pro wrestler today, yeah, you got to do it in the ring, but I would be working on my promos and my character more than anything. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what you need to worry about. Don't worry about being able to do the Hurricane Rana. <laughs> times 3000 frog splash into a luthez press or whatever arm yeah. bar uh, arm bar but you know i mean i would like to just have i think it'd be awesome to have a character that just he goes out there and he just crushes people like do kind of what you did with goldberg i mean that was yeah. people were tuning in for less than five minutes of work Oh yeah, well now you know we're we're too we're too interested in seeing the people who should be doing that playing their video games and yeah, whatever. Well, once again, why isn't why isn't the former Rusev? Why isn't he just this ass kicking monster? Yeah, in AEW, just mauling people. Yeah, like no regard, basically. Like I got screwed over in the previous company, and I'm taking it out on you people. Yeah, like, I don't care who you are. That's a that to me is a compelling. You got him like coming out in like a Mickey Mouse shirt playing video games, I can't take that guy seriously. No, not at all. So when he does have to flip that switch, it's not believable. No. And, and I mean, even right now, the fact that Bobby Lashley is world champion, if you would have told me a year from a year ago that Bobby Lashley would have been world champion, after all the nonsense of his run, the stuff of Lana and the stuff of his sisters and Sami Zayn, yeah. you can tell me that guy's going to be the world champ. You know, I'll give them credit for what they've done there. But, you know, Lashley looks, he, Lashley's guy, he doesn't need to talk. No, he doesn't. He just needs to show up and beat people. Like, yeah, he, he's too much of a physical specimen to be a comedy act. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, frankly, why aren't we, I'd like to see Lashley and Lesnar in a ring together. That would be interesting. That'd be two hosses going at it. I don't and two ultra athletic guys going. The at thing it. is, is I don't know if Brock cares enough. No, anymore for that to be a interesting match. Brock, Brock really cares about the money. Let's just, say, yeah, you know, I mean, I, but I don't, I don't know. know. If you, I don't know if you can pay him enough money to make him care about having a good match. I don't think he can. I think the thing is, physically, he can do it in his sleep. You know, he's just that talented. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's few human beings that can do what Brock Lesnar does. Oh, that big yeah. 
and that agile. That's the scary thing. It'd be one thing if he was slow. <laughs> the thing is that he's as fast as a cruiserweight sometimes. Yeah. That's scary. Like, yeah. You know, that's even the same thing with Taker. You know, Taker worked a very slow style, but where there's moments where he was able to kind of pick up the speed. And you're yeah. like, oh my gosh, look at how fast this freight train's coming. Mm-hmm. You know, I watched the Nasty Boys against Legion of Doom. Mm-hmm. It was SummerSlam 91. And good grief, they shot Animal into the ropes. Mm-hmm. I was like, holy crap, hey, that man's running faster than a sprinter. Yeah. I mean, he was moving. And those are the, you know, you could have, I mean, I don't, I'm not one that's going to say the part-timers are a bad thing because really you've always kind of had them in wrestling. Yeah. You know, um, it just, we went through such a period where you didn't see it. Yeah. You know, I, I have my year in mid South and then I go up to Memphis or, yeah you know, I go out to San Francisco or, or something, you know, you, you went to another territory. Well, but I mean, even more so than that, like during the attitude era, we, we didn't see this um, idea of, um, you know, um, part-timers. There, there were no part-timers in the attitude era that I remember. Well, not in WWE. I mean, they, there were guys who were more or less part time in WCW. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think also too the nature of the business. Yeah, you know, the I think what made the Attitude Era work is you had the last vestiges of individuals that came up through the territories. Mm-hmm. You know, and you learned you learned how to get over. Yeah. Nobody's being taught how to get over anymore. No, no you know, it's just and, a matter of what the promotion is doing for you. Yeah. And I mean, and I think that's where we get into this fact that these athletes are trying to have to be actors and they're not actors Mm-mm. and you can't take athletes or you can't take actors and have them do athletically what these guys do. Yeah. And women for that matter, you know, it is, um, yeah, nobody's getting over organically. And if you do heaven forbid you get over organically, that's gonna get shut down quick. Zach Ryder, yeah, Rusev. Mm-hmm. Rusev Day was over, man. I mean, they sold a Rusev Day calendar where every day was Rusev Day. That's yeah. brilliant. Like, and you mess that up, like, you know, you. That's why I think in the territories you had to get over. You also had to learn how to get over in front of different crowds. Yeah. And and it's not so insular that if you're working in Memphis, you might have to work differently than if you work in New York. And I, I, yeah. I was listening to an interview with Arn and Tully when they went to WWE. They had a match. I forgot who they had a match with, but they were like, you know, selling for these guys. They were bumping. And when they came back through the, you know, through the back, they thought, hey, we had a great match. And Demolition was like, what the hell are you guys doing? Giving these guys so much offense? You know, you're that's not what we do here. You know, and you have... Arn and Tully, which were coming from background of our jobs, put on the best match on the card. Yeah. We'll see if you guys can top that. And what you had in that era is, yeah, Arn and Tully were going to have a great match. And then Flair and whoever else were going to have a great match. Barry Windham and whoever were going to have a great match. They were trying to top each other, which made for a good product. But not only, not just great matches but they they made sense and there was a reason for yes. having these great matches because that's the issue that you see so often now yeah with ring of honor or whatever is that they'll have guys that for no reason well two weeks ago the the women's death match whatever whatever that they've gone from zero to 195 in no time Mm -hmm. because for whatever reason they wanted to have a lights out death match between Mm -hmm. these two women and you know if if you wanted to do that okay fine that's that's a great idea it's a great idea that you guys want to do that you ladies want to do that um how about we uh yeah how about we pencil that into the can calendar for march of next year and then Y'all come back to me next week 
with the next 52 weeks of how we're going to get there because we're not doing that next week. Uh, next week, you tell me how we're going to get there in 52 weeks and huh. we'll, we'll, you know, see how it goes. And what I don't get is there's a lot in pro wrestling that feel the, the fan base and the audience can't handle long term storytelling. Well, what's Game of Thrones? What's Law and Order? Yeah. Long term storytelling. Like, yep. you're telling me you can't do it for wrestling? Like, no, I mean, you don't want every feud to be long term. That's just not feasible. You know, you, but if you have them at different levels, and I mean, basically, WWE books WrestleMania to WrestleMania, that's how they should start. I'd like to see a year long feud that culminates at Mania. Yeah. I mean, some of the more impressive moments, you know, think about what Daniel Bryan did, the the struggle to get there at WrestleMania 30. Yeah. Uh, Becky Lynch, for what she did in that year, basically being an afterthought mm -hmm. in a pre-match battle royal to then being the most over person in the company. Yeah, absolutely. And even what, even what Kofi did, mm -hmm. that, that works. Those are, I think, three angles the fans have been more invested in than any other. Oh yeah, and how? And you, and they, and why are you not recreating that? You know, like I, I don't get it. You know, no, it just, you know, it goes back to this thing twenty years ago today. Vince has not had competition. In, I mean, to to be fair, he didn't have competition for probably a year before that, but. <laughs> at the very least he has not had competition for 20 years and also even though we look at the rock and wrestling era we look at the attitude era i think rose colored glasses there was a lot of crap there too there, there was you know i mean yeah, i think let's, let's what you have there. is you have a lot of crap but vince was able to get some diamonds out of that every now and then yeah and you know it's okay if you've been waiting through crap all day if you find a diamond yeah well i mean i think some of the stuff back in the 80s there was some stuff that like wasn't great, mm -hmm. but there was nothing that was just stupid. No, at least not in WWF. Well, well up yeah. to say 88. Yeah. Now, once you started phasing out some of those territory guys, that's where you started getting mm -hmm. Red Rooster and right. stuff like that. And then, okay, we've, you, we've been on a steady period of degeneration since then. But and And even, you know, like somebody like Terry Taylor. Why do you need to make him the Red Rooster? He's a good hand. He could have worked well in a heel faction. He could have worked well in the running for Intercontinental title or tagging with somebody. Have, have you heard Bruce Pritchard say how they actually came up with that name? Yeah. Yeah. That's got to be the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And so this know, guy's a jerk. So you come up with the idea to call him a rooster. Yeah. Because an, another name for a jerk and another name for a rooster is the same. Yeah. Guys are idiots. <laughs> yeah. And even like you think about somebody like Kerry Von Eric. Now he was past his prime. He had a lot of issues going on, but he's the Texas tornado. He's not Kerry Von Eric. The only thing he possibly what? had going for him in 1991. Yeah. Was Kerry Von Eric, the former NWA world's heavyweight yeah. champion. And you're bringing him in as the Texas tornado. You're just like, yeah. good. I mean, grief. and also even the booking for that. I mean, I think people were shocked what he was able to do in the ring, considering physically what he was dealing with. But you know, yeah, that was another miss. You know, he becomes a gimmick. He doesn't become a person. Yeah. And and even I think the Undertaker, Kane, which on paper supernatural gimmicks do not do well. They work because we ultimately saw the humanity in them. Yeah. Same thing with mankind with what Foley did. Yep. Mankind's also a crappy gimmick. Mm -hmm. Like he lives in a boiler room talking to a rat. Well, and, and that's another thing that people don't understand. People just watch that hell in a cell match. Yeah. Oh yeah. And all they see is that Foley got thrown off a cage and Foley twice. And then he got thrown on the thumbtacks and all that. Dude, they had been going for two years. Yeah. They had been going since, I think, 1996 mm -hmm. when they finally blew it off in that Hell in a Cell in 1998. Mm -hmm. So, And also Foley, knowing his background of kind of this broken figure that is, 
you know, wanted to be the Shawn Michaels of the world, but he's the Mick yeah. Foley of the world. He's yeah. this broken individual, but there's still this humanity to him. And you wonder why, what compels somebody to allow themselves to be thrown off a ring? Foley told you why. That's what he always wanted to do. And if yeah. that's how he's going to go out, that's how I'm going out. And that worked, you know, I mean, and, and I don't think we get in this era, we have more access to these wrestlers than ever before. I mean, in 1998, was there any way for us to reach directly to major names in pro wrestling? No. Today, we can't. I can get on my phone right now and go on to Twitter or Instagram, and I can tag somebody or I can send them a direct message, and they might message me back. Might. I, I never had – there wasn't even a chance I was getting a message back in 1998. No. You know, it's – and so I mean, I think, you, you could allegedly send a letter to Hulk Hogan and they would send you back a stamp signature eight by 10. And then for the next 17 years, you're getting WWF catalogs. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, but I think that's where, I mean, the biggest thing for me, the eye opener was when I was probably in the fourth or fifth grade, I finally went backstage at a WCW show. And you mm -hmm. see guys like Cactus Jack and Vader and others that are, wait a minute, they're actual people. Yeah. It freaked me out hearing the barbarian use words. <laughs> I was like, this guy can talk. Like, wait a minute. Like normally? Like, you know, and you know, but to me, that was where you if the character has no connection to the person playing it, yeah. it's not gonna work. And you can ask actors about that for their best roles, it's when they can become that person. Yeah. Um, that's what works. Yeah, and and I think we don't see that in wrestling anymore. We don't see compelling stories. We don't see compelling reasons to get behind these people. And and even Brian, people got behind Daniel Bryan because we like the underdog. We like the guy that's always counted out, standing yeah. up to the man, if you will. And, and yeah, it was, it was very you similar know. to the Austin storyline you had, but it was also very different because Brian wasn't Austin. He didn't work with the same skills Austin had necessarily no, no, there's not even close Daniel brian has that austin on his best day would have never had you know no. but, but they made it work you know and and it got over organically you know i mean that was as loud of a pop as i've ever heard when daniel brian won the title at wrestlemania 30 oh yeah place the went Superdome crazy. was unglued yeah it was crazy it was going crazy yeah and i mean and frankly you know maybe it's maybe i'm a little biased because that was the one we were at. Yeah. And I really have not seen what I would consider a great WrestleMania since I think WrestleMania is 30 is the last great WrestleMania. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could, I could buy that. You know, I, I mean, and granted in this, we're going to have two COVID WrestleManias. So we can kind of give, I'll give them a pass for the COVID mm -hmm. yeah. era, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, there's nothing that I think were spectacles and moments since then. No. No, I mean, Kofi wins, close. Becky Lynch winning. Yeah, that was great. That's maybe the closest we had. But those are two matches, and there's, you know, the, the, those are the two matches on the show, but then there's just, in the middle, it's just, eh. And I've never had, I've never been in an arena where you went from absolute total silence yep. to an hour and a half later, absolutely pure bedlam. Yeah. That Those are two polar opposites yep. reactions, and they got them. I mean, that's the thing. Ultimately, wrestling's about evoking emotion with your audience. And if you don't that, do that, that show, even all the way from the start, because you had Brian started off, that was a yes. good match. You had John Cena somewhere in the middle there. I don't remember who he wrestled. Uh, Bray Wyatt. Yeah, you're right. Remember, yeah, we were Bray upset Wyatt. that Wyatt didn't go over and all the kids around us were happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, You know, but just all the way through the show, you've got these stars. And now none of those guys are there. And then they were trying to say something about John Cena coming back for Mania this year. And he's like, well, I can't. I'm in Canada filming a movie. Mm -hmm. Dude, if WWE wanted John Cena he's there. in the ring, th th they could fly because this is all in studio with no fans anyway. They could mm -hmm. fly the ring and a crew mm -hmm. up to Canada and film it there. Mm-hmm. And then you just have JR or well, not JR, obviously, but you have whoever your two commentators are mm -hmm. do voiceover commentary. Yeah. Over the show. 
Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, Cena's really the last kind of transcendent star we've had in pro wrestling. The last star, yeah. You know? um, And same thing with The Rock. Where's John Cena? Yeah, he's He's making movies. But, you know, at a certain level, I get that because I think Cena, just like The Rock realized, my longevity as an actor is a lot better than being a pro wrestler. Yeah. And, and if I've got to, I've got to capitalize on it now, but I think, you know, you wonder in the back of Vince's mind, if I create these stars, they're eventually going to leave me. And, and my thought is, okay, well, that's just the nature of the beast. You know, a football player doesn't stay with the team for his whole career. Yeah. You know, eventually it's just going to have to hang it up eventually, no matter who it is, you know, and you build your next Brady left. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you build your next guy and they don't really do that. There's not the, I mean, I look at what will and WWE you, look like in five years from now? Is it going to look that much different than what we see now? I don't know. I mean, probably some of the NXT people will be up. But you, you think about this, you know how to prevent guys from going to the movies? Pay them enough mm-hmm. to prevent them from going to the movies. Yeah. Or say, hey, we'll let you take half the year off to make movies, but we need you for WrestleMania season. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. You yeah. know. Okay. Um, you know, I'll show up to a couple of Raws. I'll, I won't do the house shows unless I need to do it just to get in ring shape. But yeah. so many of these guys have people they can train with. They don't really need yeah. to go on the road. Well, and that's that's the thing too, especially if they're going away from the house shows. Yeah. Well, why can't these guys? <laughs> If a movie studio really wanted one of these guys, why do you not just say, okay, we're going to film with this guy Tuesday through Friday, mm-hmm. and then he's he's got the weekend off, or he works the Sunday pay-per-view, and then he's going to be at TV on mm-hmm. Monday. Or if he's a SmackDown guy, you say, okay, we're going to film Monday through Thursday, then he's going to fly out, and he's going to go to SmackDown, and then he's going to come back. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no reason not to. There's no reason to tell somebody like Randy Orton or John Cena that they can take off a freaking house show tour Mm -hmm. that is not going to draw a dime. No. You know. Well, I mean, frankly, the last show I saw was in the Hershey Center, which is a decent size arena here. Yeah. I mean, they draw decent shows, not just wrestling, but I mean, big time concerts, things like that. Um, and it was maybe half full. Yeah. And this was right after Christmas. You know, it was like a holiday show. So, I mean, there were conceivably kids getting this as like a Christmas gift. Yeah. And it wasn't sold out. You know, they didn't sell out the scope for SmackDown. No. And the scope's not that big either. And actually, think about the show we saw at MSG, the garden. Yeah. They didn't sell out the garden. Didn't sell that out. You know? Uh, Nope. You know, I mean, that's the, I think a lot of it is you have to ask, who are they writing this for? And if you're trying just appeal to your audience, just stick with that. But otherwise, you need, my idea, if you're an entertainment company, you're trying to appeal to the most amount of people possible. Yeah. And and I don't think they're doing that. I think there's ways they can do the comedy. Comedy's always been a part of wrestling. Right. But there's also been serious matches that are part of wrestling. And I think the lines are way too blurred where you have these guys that for months have been a comedic act and all of a sudden we need me to take them seriously. Yeah. Doesn't work that way. You know, that's just part of where we are since again, WCW has gone and Vince doesn't have any competition. And, and Vince, I mean, frankly, the reason Vince was so desperate in the attitude era is because I think he literally thought if I'm, if I don't do something, we're going under. Yeah. And you know, I don't know if it's apocryphal that supposedly took the water coolers out of Titan Towers during this time to save money. You know, I don't know. You know, I don't know if that's something that just over time has become part of the lore of this. Well, era. I mean, you know, Cornette said it. Year. You, you know, know Cor- Cornette has said it and he was there. Yeah. yeah. You know, these were not, I mean, we look like 94, 95. These were not good years for WWE. No, they weren't. And, I mean, they were yeah. not good for WCW either, but no, but WCW steered into this idea of Hogan turning heel. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it looked for a while like Turner was going to put 
vents out. Yeah. And yeah, there, and I think that's where we look back. The storyline has always been, it was inevitable that WWF was going to win that war. But I think when we really look back on it, that's WWF's version of this story. I think there were some periods where there are probably a few months where Vince and others are looking, how are we going to pull this out? How are we going to, I mean, how are we going to keep the lights on here? Yeah. And because they had some, had just as much money, if not more at the time. And we forget how big Ted Turner was in the 1990s. Way bigger than Vince. Oh yeah. Way bigger than Vince now, frankly. Yeah. I mean, what, True. what Turner had involved, I mean, this guy was a major player in the entertainment business, not yeah. wrestling. The entertainment he, business. he owned the Braves. He owned TBS. He owned TNT. He owned Turner Classic Movies. Yeah. Cartoon Network. Mm -hmm. um, he also owned the Atlanta Hawks. I was going to say, I thought he owned the Hawks. He owned the Hawks. So what did he do? He put the Braves and the Hawks on WTBS. He bought programming. Yeah. Like, I'm building, I'm buying a pro sports team for programming on my network that's a smart yeah. idea actually yeah you know like ball that's, games are guaranteed that you know? that's what wcw was for him ball games programming on his network wrestling. that is what built tbs mm -hmm. you know that's and and it's kind of interesting when nitro came on and they gave it they put it on tnt there was even some internal talk in tnt of well, wait a minute we're trying to be the 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 you know professional movie studio i mean they were doing big time mini series they were doing things in this area yeah. did wrestling really fit with that from what tnt was and you know and i think ultimately they found a way to make it work and, yeah but turner was i mean turner was a huge deal that i think people today don't realize because he's been kind of out of the public light frankly turner's been out of the public light for almost a generation now 20 years yeah yeah you know i mean really after the merger Oh you know, yeah, they, they bought him out and he's lived off his money in Montana or wherever he yeah. is. Yeah, and I mean, you know, that's, so I think, and ultimately I think that's where, I think there's probably with Vince and Turner. Turner was what Vince always wanted to be. Yeah. A media mogul. Vince has never been that. Vince has tried. He's tried music. He's tried movies. I'm he's surprised tried. now that Vince has not tried to get his own television network. Yeah. I can't believe he didn't try to take over some TV network. Beyond, and, and beyond wrestling. Oh, yeah. Because he know, has I mean, the content. They've got the WC, the, yeah. the WWF movie studios now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you could have had your... 11 p.m to 6 a.m programming be classic network content yeah that on monday nights we're going to show classic um mid-atlantic mm -hmm. one day we're going to show classic awa one day we're going to show ecw one night we're going to show wcw and, and the list goes on because you got seven nights so whatever he's got mm -hmm. and then during the day you have your live programming and on the weekends oh by the way you bring your xfl back Mm -hmm. And now you have, you run them on Saturday and Sunday. You can show three games each day. And now. And I would say even in the fall, go out and strike a deal with a college. Yeah. You know, you know conference, you know, play Pac-10 football or, or something, you know I mean? Yeah. Something to fill content that's going to, it's going to do fine. Yeah. You know, and, and I think, yeah, that's, but Vince wants, I think problem with Vince is he doesn't want to just be successful he wants to be the most successful and, and I think that's sometimes a problem that he's always he's striding for this goal that I just don't know if it's attainable yeah he's always going to be known as a pro wrestling guy oh yeah he's that's all he's ever going to be in the minds of yeah. almost anybody is WWE mm -hmm. <laughs> people can tell him whatever they want to tell him I'm sorry WWE is a wrestling company. Yes. They are not a movie studio. They are not anything else. They are a wrestling company that makes movies. And to me, it's like, you know, if you're if you're a national steakhouse, your job is to put out the best steak every night. If you've got amazing baked chicken, that's great. But Nobody people cares. aren't coming there to get your baked chicken. 
And Nobody I think- goes to the Angus barn no. to get chicken. Doesn't matter how good it is. You know what? Ain't nobody Frank, going to the Angus barn to get chicken. If you went to the Angus barn and did not order a steak, they should by law throw you out. Just I leave. knew a guy who would go yeah. in there and he would order a hamburger. Why? He would order a he ordered a cheeseburger. And the funny thing is, is his brother was the cook. I mean, I have no doubt that an Ang- that an Angus barn cheeseburger would be really good, but that's not what you're going there for. And it, oh god, it was funny. He ordered this cheeseburger rare. Ooh, nice. And the the waitress said, "Um, we, we <laughs> sir, we can't do that." And he goes, he said. He sat there and he was like, uh, yeah, Sean, Sean, the, the head chef back there. That's, that's my brother. Um, mm. just, just tell him it's for me and make it happen. He's here's, like, here's my waiver. He's like, yeah. if, if he doesn't believe that it's me, just have him come out and talk to me, but yeah, no, tr- trust me. We, we've, we've done this before. <laughs> I think that's where, you know, Vince first and foremost should always make sure he has the best wrestling content possible. Yeah. Make sure you have you got that secure. And then if you want to do movies, if you want to do football, if you want to do other things, but Vince has always been looking for that next big thing. Yeah. You know I mean, there was a period where he considered buying, you know, UFC. Yeah, you know, there, there were these moments where Vince was trying to add to what he's doing to get out of the the wrestling business, but frankly, that's where he made his money. And it's like like you say, that's all he's known for. And also it's and I'm all, sorry, it, that's all Stephanie's known for. It's all Vince knows. I mean, Vince Sr. was not a movie director. No, he was a wrestling wrestling promoter. You know, I mean, that's, I think now, granted, to be a good wrestling promoter, you can also promote other stuff. I mean, you look at the Crockett's, man, they controlled Charlotte for, they they ran Charlotte Entertainment. Yeah. It was wrestling, but, you know, it was movies, it was music, it was other stuff coming in, it was big events. And I think Vince doesn't understand that. That I think now that he's in his own world, he thinks he's the only show in town. I can do whatever I want, and I'm and I'm making more money than I ever have. It's not that I'm putting out good content. It's just I'm making more money than I ever have. Yeah. And you know, it's kind of like a successful album that makes money, but I don't know if you would say that's that band's best work. Yeah. They're just their most commercially successful album metallica has made a lot of money on albums in the last 20 years that have been really bad yeah they have <laughs> that have been really bad you know but I, I will always think back some you know back and this will date us when the whole napster thing was going on yep metallica and napster and mm-hmm. you know somebody said to lars ulrich you know you're you guys are sellouts it's like yeah you're right we are sellouts we sell out arenas every night yeah you know like but i think that's vince vince is making more money than he ever has before but it's not because he's making it because of a good product it's just because well and it is because he's diversified he has let's let's be fair with that it is because he's diversified but it's also because it's they're global yeah and that's that's something that i don't think 20 years ago we ever thought was a thing no if you would have told me 20 years ago there was going to be wwe programming specific not just reruns being played overseas but specific programming in england in india in india yeah that's unbelievable in other markets i mean there the the one in japan is not there yet right no i don't think it's there yet but But the india one is yeah or at the very least it is well past the concept stage and i hate and you know i I hate to say it you know as much as let me look on my phone here to see if it is actually there but I, I know they, they did the one specific India show where they got the Indian wrestlers and teamed them with Charlotte and teamed them with Finn Balor and so on and so forth. Well, what I would like to see, you know, I mean, and yeah, as much as Vince gets kind of, you know, people pile on him, frankly, and even if it's not Vince's decision, whoever in WWE said we need to move to India. Yeah. Probably a smart person. Because that's an expanding market. 15% of the world's population. That's a huge untapped market right now. 
Yeah. And, you know, that's, and Vince has clearly shown no qualms about who he does business with. I mean, <coughs> Saudi Arabia. <coughs> um, sorry. Sorry, something got stuck in my throat there. Um, so, I mean, he's, they're diversifying more than they've ever been. But I think we're not seeing that you would think conceivably with access to more talent, they would have better programming. Yeah. That hasn't gone. But I think you also have a bunch of their writers aren't wrestling people. Oh, their no. writers are somebody that a year ago was working on a sitcom. Yeah, they have no idea about um, what's going and, on. I mean, are you telling me you can't find a group of writers our age that grew up watching classic wrestling? You're trying to tell me they're not out there that you can't find someone that has legitimate writing credentials, but also remembers Ultimate Warrior versus Hulk Hogan. Yeah, but I don't. I you know I don't think they want that. No, they don't. And you know, because it's the idea of they're trying to be anybody connect. What I what I think is so funny. There's almost some. There's almost a self loathing at WWE that if you're wrestling and you're just wrestling, you're somehow not good enough which is really strange for a wrestling company to say that, or excuse me, entertainment company to say that. Yeah. You know, I think that's where if somebody really wanted to compete, if I was AEW, you know, yeah, they got a guy in Tony Khan that's got money. You got to have somebody with money. There's just yeah. no other way around that. Right. Without his money, they're not on TNT. No. It's not happening. No. You know, um, but if I was Tony Khan, I would look at, okay, if we try to be like our competition here, we don't have the ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. We're not a global company. No. We're not, heck, we're barely a national company for that matter. Yeah. You know, so what do we do? We have to be different. We have to find a, a path that's our own and build on that. You know, you you can't try to take on McDonald's selling cheeseburgers. <laughs> yeah, you're not. You got the best it. cheeseburger in the world, but McDonald's is going to make more of them, and a lot quicker. For less money. Yeah, you know. So, so find what you're good at, and really steer into that. I mean, if it was me, I would make AEW the polar opposite of WWE. We wouldn't have instead of just being the the dumb stuff that Vince would not have let you do. Yes. Yeah. Because that's what it is. Yeah. Like, that's what wrestling has come to, is that the second biggest company, rather than having Bill Goldberg against Hulk Hogan, they have whoever against whoever doing the stuff that is dumber than anything Vince would have done. If Vince has an exploding ring death match on one of the bigger pay-per-views of the year, you pretty much know that ring is going to blow up the way it's supposed to blow up yes it's something yeah you know i hate to say it what happened with that ring is as close to a shock master moment as we have had in a long long time it made even oh, the yeah, guys yeah. selling it look so stupid because they didn't know what was going on yeah but it was like you're you're freaking out like the world's collapsed and there's like a sparkler above you yeah eddie kingston thought the world was going to come to yeah. an end with flashbangs and everything else. And I hate to say it, AEW is, you know, there's a gap there, but AEW and it's like, is ultimately the evolutionary byproduct of WCW. To a point, yeah. Also, look at actually a lot of the people working on AEW television right now are former Turner people. Tony Schiavone, Jim Ross, yeah. Arn Anderson, Tully, Sting, and even some of the, from what I understand, some of the producers, some of the people that do, you know, the backstage work. Yeah. Are all former Turner. And I mean, cause let's face it, AEW is not going to go out and get their own crew. You know, no. the deal with Turner is we'll provide you a crew. Yeah. So, you know, and even then the problem with WCW is you have guys taping pro wrestling that a week before might've been filming from the third base side at Atlanta Fulton County stadium. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas Vince would have guys, you just do wrestling. Yeah. And and Vince was your, always your job is that you are the hard camera operator. And yeah. you're gonna be the best one of those in the world that I can get. And I have heard accounts even in the eighties and nineties, if you walked into the production facility at Titan Towers, it 
rivaled anybody in the world. I mean, even like yeah. major network quality, it was better than what some of those networks have. Well, yeah, you know, Vince why always, why wouldn't that be what you spend money on? Because that's yeah. that's what matters. That's the only thing people are going to see. Yep. Well, it's the idea of, you know, why don't wrestling announcers watch the ring? You watch the camera. You watch what's being broadcast to the viewer. That's what you're selling, yeah. you know, because you don't know what perspective, if you don't know what perspective that camera's at, how do you know what you're talking about? You know, yeah. you have to watch the, you have to watch the monitor. And, and I think that's where Vince is always going to do well in production value. Nobody's going to out production WWE. No. Um, and so I think, you know, if you're, if you are AEW, I think what you do is you do a grittier product, a darker product, a more mature product. And, and it, mature does not mean Edge and Lita. No. Gagging on a bed in the middle of the ring. I would just say mature means knock out the kitty crap. You know, have some good matches, have some, you know, it. And there's talent. I mean, MJF is as good of a heel as I've seen. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's... he's. I mean, MJF no. could work in any era as a heel. And but then, then you have to wonder, what image are you projecting to the public? Mm -hmm. This is right back. Ric Flair in a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Look at Chris Jericho. Look at the reaction that Jericho got when he came on after that NBA game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whoa yeah now in his defense chris jericho is in better shape than probably 99.9 percent .9 of people his age like but he's not when you compare him to brian cage no and i you know brian brian cage you know he, he probably takes his hulk hogan vitamins brother brother but um did you know prayers come in a syringe <laughs> <laughs> wow just saying uh believe in yourself yeah um i don't i don't need to believe in myself i've got this anabolic steroid that'll do it for me um <laughs> oh good grief but, but yeah i mean you know like what you should be using jericho for frankly it's not bad that he's in a faction that worked for flair of evolution yeah you know use him to build future stars but the thing with flair in evolution was that he was not the star right yeah yeah i Whereas think they're, they're trying to make jericho the star and even you i don't know it just it seems very the chris jericho is, needs to get on the al snow workout plan yeah he does because al snow looks stunning life. Yeah. Man, had, had Snow looked like that 20 years ago, he might have main evented Mania. Yeah, he might have. <laughs> you know? I mean, Al Snow looks like a machine. But, you know, once again, there is, I understand you need recognizable names to build up these people that maybe an audience doesn't know. But I look at it and it's like basically anybody that has executive producer attached to them in AEW. Oh, yeah. Champs. Is getting all the time. Oh, yeah. They're the champs. How's that any different than everybody that had favored nation status in WCW? Everybody had creative control. It's the yeah. same thing. And ultimately, it's going to be the same level of problems coming down the pike. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just think they are. Because yeah, one, I think day, one really, of these guys is not going to want to do the job that mm -hmm. they need to do. And, or they're not going to want to do it the way it needs to be done. And the challenge is now, you know, you'd say, okay, well, you don't have an option to go anywhere. Yeah, you do. So these guys go in the indies and do just fine. Or go to the Ring indies. of Honor. Yeah, I mean, or there's go options for you. Impact. Go to New Japan, you know, um, go overseas. You know, I mean, there's yeah. options for you. And so I think that's going to be the problem that, okay, if you don't give me what I want, I'm just, I'm going to leave. Yeah, I'll just leave. And, and I think that's the, that's the problem that you need to have. It's good that we have those options because it gives wrestlers, frankly, alternatives. And I think a thing that we're looking at now that has hurt 
business is the the guaranteed contracts. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's great for the it's great for the company because you know they're going to be around, and it's mm -hmm. maybe better financially for the wrestlers. But on the whole, now if you're sitting here as wrestler X and they pitch you some stupid angle, mm -hmm. well, what's your option? Mm -hmm. You know, you're not Steve Austin. You can't just walk out. And and I can give an example of this. You know, I am, my job is the same type of job as a professional wrestler. I'm an independent contractor. Independent contractor. You know, and the problem is with that, the way I'm treated by the federal government as an independent contractor is a lot different than a pro wrestler is treated as an independent contractor. And, you know, I think we're we're not out of the gun yet that I don't think that WWE might start drawing bigger attention from certain States and, and the federal government yeah, in terms of their labor practices. Um, you know, how can I be an independent contractor, but I can only work for you. Yeah. Well, that's, that's going to start hurting all the companies too, because mm -hmm. let's face it, any of these big companies, WWE, AEW, impact ring of honor all four of those are big enough and have enough backers that they're trying to i mean if if you can take outside bookings that's one thing mm -hmm. because then they're not in control mm -hmm. but those wwe guys can't take outside bookings no and, and i get why vince does that because you really don't want a guy getting hurt in a, a at a vfw hall in topeka kansas yeah you're doing your pay-per-view tomorrow um, i mean like even if you just wanted to say okay if we're going to sign you to a contract with ring of honor mm -hmm. okay you can't work for impact or whatever but you can work for any of these other companies down here that's different than saying you can't work for anybody mm -hmm. because that i think you could legally defend mm -hmm. yeah whereas like even even ovw didn't used to and this was i mean just two years ago didn't used to let their guys work for iwa mid-south mm -hmm. because it was a local territory but you could work for anybody else mm -hmm. and so well, and that's that that's that's the rough thing is now everybody's on guarantee and nobody can work for anybody else and and also you know the guarantees the guarantees are great and i even look at my own job if i was paid a set amount whether i do a great job or not and i get paid either way yeah there's no incentive for me to get better whereas the idea is i have the opportunity what i do with that opportunity is on me so finding ways you know to do things outside of what i do to build on it same thing as me if i was a wrestler going to another territory for a little bit yeah you know, and, and honing my skills there. And, and I think we would see better, we would see better wrestlers if that and, happened. And I'm sure in your case, there are people in your guild or what as an mm -hmm. association, is it mm -hmm. that yeah. get more bookings than others? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Because yeah. word of mouth that the public knows that this one is better than this one. And it, you, you get you know, more. It, I, you know, it's amazing, you know, some of my friends that I work with that are wrestling fans, we talk about how similar our job is sometimes to pro wrestling, even we'll use terms like, you know, everybody's trying to get over, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, but, but there is that, you know, not everybody's going to be a Ric Flair, not everybody's going to be the rock, but successful wrestling companies need those top end stars. Yeah. But they also need the mid card guys. They also need the jobbers. Everybody has a role to play. Yeah. And, and I think that's the, you know, we're not finding, we, WWE's had success with guys that have gone elsewhere and have come back. Drew McIntyre is a perfect Bobby example. Lashley. Lashley too, you know, and they, and I think that's okay if they weren't ready yet and then they come back to you. I mean, why not have certain talent in WWE that's allowed to go outside of things? Yeah. You know, you, maybe you have the set guaranteed guys. Then you can have some say, hey, it's better for me where I'm at in the card right now to be able to go work some indies, to be able to go work some other stuff. Yeah. That, you know what, I may not be ready to be a WWE top talent right now, but I could go into Impact right now and I could tear the house down and I'm going to learn those skills to make yeah. me better 
to when I come back. Or you you let them work for independence, but make sure they're like reputable Mm -hmm. independence. Like, okay, yeah, I'm going to let you go work for these independent shows. But if I see a YouTube video of you Mm -hmm. working in somebody's backyard, throwing Mm -hmm. somebody off of a, of a house trailer, Mm -hmm. no, we're, we're going our separate ways here. There is a history of WWF doing that. You know, how many times did WWF talent show up at ECW at times? Or yeah. Smoky Mountain, or vice versa, you know? Yeah. WWE's had success working with others. And, you know, it's, I think it would create a better product overall. Because you're training now for some of these talents, you know, you're a high-end athlete in college, or maybe a former professional athlete. You go to the performance center, you only learn the WWE way. Yeah. Everything is fed to your character, your gimmick, everything. It's not, you're not developing it. And, you know, I think that's a problem that people aren't comfortable enough in their own skin. I would love to see on a pro wrestling show, they say, we're not scripting any promos tonight. We're handing you a mic. We're going to tell you how long it is and what you need to talk about. Go. Yeah, you hear like Cornette and those guys talking about doing the, you know, the promos at Crockett days. And there are certain guys, they knock it out in no time at all. Yeah. You know, but you don't have that today. And you can tell when wrestlers today have to think on their feet, they can't do it. No, they can't. Yeah, it's, you know. Um, Some of I mean, them can. Yeah, but it's not It's not the ad-libbing that Austin Flair or The Rock did. No. Because they also okay. don't have the ability to do that. Right. Um, they, they've never learned how to do it. I've often wondered could Austin cut the Austin 316 promo today? I don't think they would hand him that. I don't think the writers would have handed him that pro that promo. And at that level, at that point where he was in the company, he wasn't the top guy when he made that promo. No, but the thing is, is like that, that goes back to something else. It's like, everybody acts like there's nothing else or whatever. And it's like, Dude, go out and do whatever you're going to do. You just tell them, hey, listen, this is the deal. If you put the microphone in my hand on this TV, mm-hmm. I'm saying what I want to say. And if you want to fire me, fire me right now. Hey, think but about as, the summer of punk. But as, but as long as you put this microphone in my hand, I'm saying what I want to say. Well, remember when the Rock and Roll Express went into the Hall of Fame and Cornette got up at the hall of fame and it was like dear god jim Cornette has a live mic yeah <laughs> you know i'm jim I mean, Cornette, and this microphone's live oh boy you know but you think about why was i mean you think about really you know some last you, know, you look at like even punk's run yeah what they call the summer punk that was compelling because you really did not know what punk was going to say on the mic no and and it yeah. felt real yes yeah that's the difference like the promos in the attitude era and even in the 80s yeah felt real you know i mean you mentioned earlier hard times by dusty Rhodes. man people feel that i joke yeah, they some, do. Uh, political candidates my hand, hand is touching times. your hand i mean could you imagine you take say you're, you're running for president and you get the nomination and you go into your convention and you basically give a hard times type speech yeah dude you're gonna blow the house down yeah like you know and the thing is that worked because those people watching were the people that, yeah, my job at the mill just ended. Somebody yeah. gave me a watch and kicked me on the butt and said, see you later. See you know, later. Like, a machine just took your job. You know, like it. it was a computer that took your job, daddy. That's hard you know, times. <laughs> you know, I mean, hard you're, like, you're like, yeah. I don't even know what he was talking about, but man, he meant what he said. I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you believe in it. That's exactly right. And that's the difference. But you know what? Are you telling me that Dusty Rhodes today, if he went through the same process, say Dusty Rhodes after he finished playing college football, went into the performance center? No. No, it wouldn't be close. But Dusty learned being at the various territories, learning what works, learning from the greats around him. Exactly. That's what does it. You know I mean, Flair's promos worked because they were real. Yeah, they were. Yeah, these weren't works. I mean, when Flair is saying, 
you know, all the women between 18 and 24 years old, we're going to be at the Atlanta Marriott tonight. We've got mm -hmm. the, the upper end booked. Come out and see us. He's not joking, folks. No, he, he means that. Like, he means it. Like, it means if you are 18 to 24, come and see him. Yeah. Like, and like the stuff Flair says in his promos, you're like, oh my God. Like, I can't yeah. believe he's saying this. Yep. And, but what are you going to do, Garvin, ride around in your pickup truck with that golden retriever you call a girlfriend? It's like, here's whoa. the thing, too. You, you couldn't take Ronnie Garvin and have him try to do a Flair promo. No. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't, no, it wouldn't work. You know, it wouldn't work. And so you have to commit to that gimmick to make yep. it work. And yeah, I mean, to the fact that when the horsemen attacked Dusty Rhodes in the Omni, there was a riot yeah. in the Omni where yep. like Arnie Anderson, those guys, like we didn't know if we were getting out of the ring alive. That's yeah, when Ole turned on Dusty in the cage match in the Omni. That's he started going crazy. You know, I mean, I, and you hear like some of these accounts from the territories. If you didn't cause a riot, you weren't doing your job that night. Like, I mean, the idea of people getting shot at, people getting stabbed, like wrestling was no joke back in the day. Yeah. And, and it's amazing Cornette didn't get killed. Yeah, it is. I'm amazed Cornette never got killed, frankly. Some There's crazed guy in Louisville in believed it's real, mm -hmm. you know? And, but that works. And these aren't, you could do those same things today and it would set you apart from WWE because they're not doing it. If you become believable and you're somewhat accessible, yeah, that would do really well. And and that was that believability ended what mm -hmm. a week from today. W and what was I would it, say was it a week, six days? Yeah. Mania 17, whatever Mania 17 was. That's it. Because that's when you had Austin and Vince shaking hands in the ring. Yep. And that was it. And also, you know, with the idea that house shows are probably going away in certain communities. Mm -hmm. If I was AEW, that's where I would go. Any area that WWE has vacated, yeah. I'm coming in. I'm saturating Absolutely. the local market. I am, you know, we may not be able to do the arenas that WWE did, but we can find comparable arenas. I'm you putting know. ads in the newspapers and we're going to be in the West Carteret gym yep. every Tuesday night. Yeah. I'm going to send two main eventers down mm -hmm. and then we're going to find six to eight local guys mm -hmm. and we're running the West Carter at high school gym. Well, and also there's AEW has a really bloated roster right now. I, I looked the other day at who they're at their roster things massive. Yeah. For the amount of television time they have, I would put some of those, put them on the road. You know, some ones you're not utilizing, let mm -hmm. them home. I would just say, go out there and, frankly go out there and get over yeah find what works and then come back to us you know yeah. and no different than like you know sports teams have minor league teams you know you mm -hmm. might have to play at triple a for a couple of years before you get to the big leagues yeah but, but and that's so that's that's what you do you send some major guys you advertise it as aew yeah. live yeah but you go to mm -hmm. again moorhead city north carolina and you run the West Carter at gym 52 weeks a year, you know, we're not talking about doing our death matches. No. Go in there, put on a good two hour show and go home and run it every week. Don't be taking no crazy bumps, but again, run it every week. And I bet you would see the ratings go up. Yeah. Well, it also exposes people to them, you know, and it feels like those are our guys. Yeah. Up there. You know, there we have that connection to them. WWE and AEW easily have enough wrestlers now that they could probably both of them pick a hundred cities mm -hmm. and say we are running these hundred cities mm -hmm. weekly. Mm -hmm get local talent and send a couple of name people. And also, and yes, saying, Randy Orton is not going to wrestle in the West Carter at high school gym every week. No, but maybe once every three months you send him there. 
and also what you do is you send some of your talent scouts you bring some of your producers down having these shows because who knows who you might see it from some of that local talent yeah you might see the next big thing yeah absolutely and you know it and have them develop i would have if i start a pro wrestling company today i would do it completely different than wwe because you're as we said you're not going to compete against them no you're not you've got to be different than them you need and to that's, find a different way to get more viewers and frankly bischoff did that for a while with wcw you know and yeah people talk about giving the results away and things like that but it gave such a sense of spontaneity yeah that people didn't know what was going to happen the problem is you can only do that so much yeah then the surprises kind of become old well and not knowing what's going to happen and having crazy surprises every week is Mm -hmm. not the same as not knowing what's going to happen and i don't know how that makes sense but i I think you get yeah i get what you're going well there has Um, to be some level of storyline of what's going on it can't be we have a wrestling show we don't know what it's going to be about but it's a wrestling show yeah it's like a baseball game you know Mm -hmm. you're showing up to a baseball game and you don't know what the result's going to be but they uh they don't have fireworks night at the triple a stadium every night they only have fireworks maybe once a month. Mm-hmm. Um, they only do the bat giveaway once a month. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it, it's, it's something like that. If mm-hmm. you do the bat giveaway every week, every, every night for mm-hmm. 60 games a year, nobody cares about the bat giveaway. Mm-hmm. And that's what wrestling has turned into in mm-hmm. 20 years since WCW is that we, it, it, every night, every time, you turn into AEW or NXT or Ring of Honor, or whatever. You're seeing some crazy match that mm-hmm. you would have seen once a year, 25, 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. But you see it two times a week now, and nobody cares because eh, whatever. Yeah, and okay. I, I I seen that last week. And even you know, I would even for some of these house shows, if I was AEW, I'd have jobbers getting squashed. Bring back the squash matches. Yeah. They work like you want to get somebody over as a monster, have them start destroying people. And you know, if you're going to do that in a house show, even have him do it with a mic in his hand. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is one of you hillbillies from local mm-hmm. and just start kicking yeah. him in the face. Yeah. You fat boy in the front row. I'm kicked yeah. here. This one's for you. Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, you know, you know how much heat you would draw in an arena if you're like, I'm going to fight you one-handed. Yeah. I'm I'll fight commentate you. my own. Man. Yeah. You know, that would be, that'd be awesome. Actually, that would be a fun gimmick even on television. And then, so you, you grab somebody by the hair, but then on the microphone, you tell them what's going on at the same time you tell the crowd what's going on. To the turnbuckle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just hit my own microphone. Yeah. <laughs> I got too excited about going to the turnbuckle there. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, they don't, and it, you have to have some creativity. You have to have yeah the ability to connect with people. And, and we're not seeing that today. Like, no. And uh, to me, that's like the biggest thing that, that we have lost mm-hmm. is that there's just no creativity. No. Yeah. And, you know, that's the problem is it's been, there's a worry of things getting overproduced. Yeah. I think right now pro wrestling at the, at the top levels is overproduced. Way overproduced. And I mean, even, even at the very least, you're four top companies. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we talked about them earlier. You know, we've talked about The Rock. We talked about Austin. Look at the first gimmicks they were given in WWF. The Ringmaster. Rocky Maivia. Rocky my die, Rocky die. You know, these were those were crap gimmicks. Yeah, they were. Like definitely were. That they succeeded in spite of. Yeah. And John like, Cena. Yeah. That yeah. gimmick of his had no business succeeding. Oh, and Frank Batista. Frank, what? Batista. Oh God. Look at, the, look at the state of him, and you're gonna put a t-shirt on him. Yeah. Well, I mean, even like Austin, 
they put him with DiBiase because they felt Austin couldn't talk. <laughs> like, yeah. what? Did you like, watch anything he did in ECW? Yeah. <laughs> like, really? Um, and and I, but it took them to get over. Yeah. On their own, they had to find out how to do that. Yeah. And to me, that's the sign of a real talented worker. It's been able to reinvent themselves and stay relevant. And I mean, ultimately, that's why I consider Taker one of the greatest of all time. Oh yeah, for sure. He made that Absolutely. gimmick from 1990 to essentially 2020 mm-hmm. work yeah he did how many performers in any genre and entertainment have been relevant for 30 years yeah no it's, you're it's really not hard many. pressed to find some yeah, you know not many and and not you know uh, you know it's not the monkeys selling out an arena somewhere right you know it's the monkeys in 1997 charting you know, yeah. just like you did in the '60s, and and I think you lose that when you don't have the the ability to be creative. You you lose it. I mean, I think about my job. If they gave me a script that I had to do every day, I'm gonna be lousy at my job. Yeah, I am. I am successful because I have the freedom. This is the parameters of what I need to do. Yeah, but how I do it is up to me. And I base it off the audience. I base it off of what has worked in the past. I base it off the group I'm with. You know basically get yourself over in front of this group you it's you no don't different tell the carload of people from north carolina about the involvement of the people from brooklyn yeah in the care. battle yeah <laughs> they, they're not concerned about that no and now if my job was to go out and be a heel yeah i would do that <laughs> i wish i could have a day where i could just turn heel for a day um cut promos on my groups all day those um, Brooklanders, they beat the daylights out of those Carolinians. You don't, you don't know how many times I want, like, whenever I get a mic on a bus, I'm just so tempted, especially when it's like a group of, like, everybody. I just want to get on the mic and just go, what I'd like to have right now. What I'd like to have right or, now. Or, you like, cut my music, you know. Just cut, cut a Rick Rude promo on somebody. Cut the like, music. Sweat hogs. And, and that's, like, in the first five minutes of the tour. Yeah. We're going to yeah. set the tone for this one. Set it early, you know? You know, I mean, like, that... Or, you know, I don't know. Maybe, like, on my work pants, I airbrushed the face of somebody's wife on my crotch. I don't know. You know? I, he did that with Jake Roberts, right? Yeah! Yeah, that's the biggest... That's the biggest power flex in the history of wrestling. That's great. What am I going to do? I'm not just going to hit on your wife. Yeah, I'm yeah. airbrushing her face on my tights. Yep. Like, that's brilliant that's good why didn't i do that to somebody in high school like you know how much heat you would have drawn around prom season if you put somebody's like prom date on your pants and showed up to school or show up to the prom that way yeah that yeah you might have gotten a fight that you want to draw heat that's what you got to do you know that's true i mean drawing heat isn't to be liked so you know i mean i think like but the same things that when you put talent finds talent will find a way to succeed yeah in any they'll find a way to to get there the difference is when people look at it and say well okay this person's talented but they haven't gotten over are they really that talented in the end i mean are there some things they can do well yeah yeah but do they do they have the keys to that no steve austin's don't grow on trees no rick flair's don't grow on trees but i guarantee you where they don't grow Mm-hmm. They also don't grow in no writer's room. No, they don't. No, they don't. You know, I mean, heck, I would bet if you got some of the old timers from NWA, WWE, and you had them write the shows that they're putting on now, they'd be infinitely more entertaining than what you're seeing these writers churning out. Way better. Like, and man, with that one, I almost got to almost got to go get the kids you got any final thoughts on wcw we've been going for a little while yeah we had, well you know there's a lot to talk about i mean this is one of those monumental moments in pro wrestling history absolutely this is not you know i mean this isn't us saying it's important this is a critical yeah. date in the history of the industry turning point i mean i would argue if were, turning point if you would have to put say in pro wrestling history the five most important moments this is one of them it's got to be got if be. not maybe one or two frankly mm-hmm. yeah uh, with the direction that the business has gone mm-hmm. um and so yeah i mean it's heck we come back and talk even more about this later i know yeah so you, you yeah we, we, we could go for a while on this one 
yeah but yeah man that's that's what we got wcw um 20 years a bit of a reflection here we we obviously lived through it mm -hmm. lived through the whole thing maybe we weren't quite old enough to understand exactly what was going on i mean i wasn't reading dirt but, sheets yeah in high school i mean i would read stuff on the internet here and there but i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't say i was a smart fan but i wasn't a mark either yeah i was kind of like in, in the middle there we were know? like act like we, we were fans yeah but yeah, it, it, it wasn't like, yeah, didn't get too involved, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's big moment. I mean, this is a this was a moment when everything changed. Definitely. So, Definitely. I guess, you know, that's kind of a theme of 2001, the year everything changed. The year so, everything changed. No. And I don't think we can top that. So. Nope. Fans, uh, if you hung around this long, we really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you again next time.